Uh, good evening and welcome once again. Uh, welcome to tonight's uh, virtual meeting of the Boston School Committee. Uh, let's begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much for that. And, um, you know, I am a parent of three uh, VPS students, but I can never seem to get them to want to be on camera and hold the, uh, the flag for us, but maybe one of these meetings. Um, we, um, we have a full uh, agenda tonight, but before we begin, I, uh, given that this is a virtual meeting, uh, we ask uh, Ms. Sullivan uh, to call the roll uh, and take attendance of all the members. So Ms. Sullivan, if you would, and if all the members would please unmute their microphones to um, indicate their presence. Sure, I'm sorry, if you could just bear with me. Um, Mr. O'Neill? Yes, present. Mr. Tran? Yes. Ms. Um, Oliver Davila? Present. Um, sorry. Ms. Robinson? Present. Mr. Tran? Sorry. Present. Ms. Dr. Rivera? Here. Mr. Lacanto. Present. Mr. Lacanto. Present. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, well, thank you for that, um, Ms. Sullivan. So, um, as uh, many of you know, tonight's meeting is being broadcast and shared live on Zoom. Uh, it will be rebroadcast on Boston City TV and YouTube at a later date. And that link will also be posted to the school committee's webpage. Uh, for those of you that are joining us on Zoom uh, tonight's meeting, uh, as well as those who might be um, checking in with us uh, later, uh, tonight's meeting documents are posted on the committee's webpage, bostonpublicschools.org slash school committee under the April 29th meeting tab. Uh, as you uh, uh, may be familiar, we have uh, interpretation services available at all of our meetings. Uh, tonight, there will be an interpreter available in Spanish. Uh, Mr. Bernal, would you please unmute yourself and introduce yourself in Espanol? Thank you, Mr. Lacanto. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Juan Bernal. I am the Spanish interpreter. I will provide live interpretation during the public comment portion of the meeting for those in need of interpretation. I will proceed now to make the same comment in Spanish. <clears throat> Buenas tardes para todos. Mi nombre es Juan Bernal. Soy el intérprete para español y voy a proveer interpretación en vivo durante la reunión y durante los comentarios públicos para aquellas personas que necesiten el servicio de interpretación. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Please proceed, Mr. Lacanto. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bernal. Um, thank you as well to uh, those, um, those members of the public that signed up for public comment this evening. Um, sign up for both public comment periods closed at 4.30 p.m. And um, I will, we'll note this when we get the public comment a little bit uh, later uh, as well, but um, just as a reminder for folks that uh, have just tuned in, um, if you are speaking tonight and if you have signed up to testify this evening, please make sure that your Zoom account um, is logged in using the same name that you use to sign up for public comment this evening. So that way it makes it a lot easier for all of us to find you in the um, uh, in the participant category and move you up so that you can speak when uh, when it's your turn. Uh, so thank you for working with us and thank you for con continuing to work with us as we move through uh, this new era of uh, virtual meetings. Uh, so we'll begin now with the business, which is uh, typically begins with the approval of minutes uh, from prior meetings. And we're seeking approval this evening for minutes from the April 15th, 2020 school committee meeting. So at this time, I'd like to entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the April 15th meeting as presented. Uh, so move. Uh, thank you. It sounds like uh, Mr. Tran and a second from uh, Ms. Uh, Robinson. Any discussion or objection to the motion? 
Hearing none, uh, again, as, as this is a virtual meeting, uh, we do not ask for uh, unanimous consent, but we do ask for uh, the uh, executive secretary to call the roll for uh, all action items, including the approval of minutes. So members, if you please unmute, uh, Ms. Sullivan, we please call the roll. Dr. Coleman. Dr. Coleman. I don't believe, is Dr. Coleman on? Okay. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Dr. Oh, Dr. Dr. Rivera? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Tran? Yes. Ms. Oliver Davila? Yes. Mr. Lacanto? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Sullivan. We'll move on now to the superintendent's report. I present to you our superintendent, Dr. Brenda Caselius. She's muted. Sorry. Thank you. I do this all day long. I'd have that mute button figured out by now. So <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. And thanks everybody for being with us tonight. Um, and thanks everybody who's on virtually. Uh, I have just very brief comments today. Um, I wanna uh, first give some updates on our meals. Um, early this week, we surpassed 300,000 meals served since school opened, or excuse, since school closed on March 17th. And as of today, we've pr provided 334,464 uh, meals across 17 BPS sites. And I just cannot thank our food nutrition staff, custodians, bus drivers, monitors, and all our uh, hundreds of volunteers who uh, put in the effort. And special thanks to um, Tammy Poost, Sam DePina, and Charlene Briner on, on our team who have been uh, shepherding this along with the logistics and the coordination with our city sites as well. So many thanks to everybody and the whole team effort to get that done. Tomorrow we're on track to surpass 100,000 meals delivered to our special ed students uh, who would otherwise maybe have difficulty in getting those. So many thanks to our special ed team uh, in addition to all the others that I mentioned in getting those meals out to our families. We are serving about 15,000 meals a day, including about 4,500 to 5,000 meals that are being delivered. Um, so that's quite a bit of uh, food going out the door and it's much needed. And uh, we say that we're not just in the education business, but we're also in the business of taking care of our children and families and whole communities health and well being during this time of COVID. Breakfast and lunch, just as a reminder, are served uh, Monday through Friday, 830 to 1130. Uh, information on locations and dozens of other emergency meal sites throughout the city of Boston is available at bostonpublicschools.org. Um, you can also call 311 and find out about city of Boston sites as well. Um, thank you again to our food nutrition staff, bus drivers, monitors, volunteers, and I, a special thank you to Mr. O'Neill for visiting uh, this week to uh, several of our sites and bringing them some joy. As for technology, we had a milestone that we uh, surpassed this week with distributing more than 30,000 Chromebooks for our students since school started on, on uh, March, excuse me, since school closed. I don't know why I want to say started. Remote learning started on uh, March 17th. Access to adequate technology is essential for our students to continue learning at home. Um, this includes Wi Fi. And so we've also been able to provide hotspots uh, to over 2,400 um, students. So really excited about that opportunity and then working with families with Comcast and Verizon, a couple of our partners who have uh, been working with us on our internet services. Um, again, if you need a Chromebook, please go to bostonpublicschools.org mm -hmm. forward slash laptop. And that is available in 10 district languages. Uh, so if you know somebody, a neighbor, someone who needs one, please go to bostonpublicschools.org um, forward slash laptop and sign up. I wanted to inform the school committee that uh, we did receive DESE guidance uh, late on Friday regarding uh, the remote, remote learning expectations that they had for school districts. We have been um, working hard to adjust our remote learning uh, expectations to those that the DESE has put out. Um, as well as a provision in there regarding the 185th calendar day of the school year um, and an, an opportunity for us to appeal given that we did provide 
additional learning opportunities for students during that week, that first week of closure. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm going to be giving um, you, Mr. Chair, a letter uh, tomorrow requesting uh, that we move forward with an appeal for our last day of school and also in that uh, recommendation for our seniors and their last day. So expect that in the box uh, tomorrow and that will outline the appeal process. As for remote learning, we're well on our way. Uh, teachers have been furiously going and getting professional uh, development and sharing best practice. Very proud of the great examples that we're seeing across the district. As we know though, there are several teachers who are still uh, emerging in their skills. And so we continue to provide professional development um, to them um, during this time and finding new ways to engage our school leaders to ensure that we're mitigating as much um, learning loss as possible. Um, we know that we are going longer now this school year after the governor's announcement last week. Um, so we will be uh, going to the end of the school year uh, in a re remote um, environment and providing instruction that way. We will be ramping up a little bit more of our expectations around how we support our students, especially those who we still um, know may not be connected or not engaging. Um, we plan on looking at new data dashboards um, and getting information um, and sharing that out with our equity roundtable, um, which we've been meeting with every week since um, the closure. We'll also be communicating that out to our families um, and we'll be letting them know what the new expectations are as we begin to uh, take attendance and begin to um, work with our uh, families and provide for personalized plans for those students who are struggling the most. So with that, that's all that I have. I forgot to unmute myself as well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, excellent. Thank you, um, Superintendent. Uh, we'll open it up now to uh, members for uh, questions and discussion. Looks like uh, Ms. Robinson uh, will speak first. For yes. other members, um, if you'd like to uh, virtually raise your hand using mm -hmm. the um, uh, Zoom uh, option to do that or otherwise figure out a way to get my attention, we'll go around the horn. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for the update and you know, all the extremely hard work that everyone is doing. Just thank everyone for what they're doing. A um, couple of questions around the meals. Um, now that the school um, closure has been extended to the end of the year, is, uh, is the expectation that you will still continue to provide meals? Or I had heard something about there was a plan whereby families would be getting an extra $5.20 a day on their SNAP cards to pay for food since children are now home? Yeah, those are really good questions, uh, Ms. Robinson. We are doing a couple of things. One, we are absolutely going to continue to deliver food. Um, there is a new uh, way of delivering uh, food in terms of trying to do multiple days of food to families. It's been a, a, that becomes less burdensome for the family to be able to deliver them multiple days. And it's also a greater efficiency for us. So we've been trying that out this week. Um, and then in terms of the additional resources to families, I haven't heard the amount that you shared, but I do know that there are some flexibilities that came with the last stimulus package around the EBT cards. I know that our, um, our staff is exploring those options. I don't think that we have uh, anything to communicate with on that though for tonight. All righty, thank you. Um, my other question again is about the continuation of online learning. Um, so the question is, how are we engaging with families? I mean, we, we all read every day in the newspapers, the number of stories of families who are just frustrated, et cetera, with what's doing or have just decided to sign off. So my question is, are we at all able to engage family by family, not school, you know, because many families have multiple children in multiple schools um, who have different expectations. How are we checking in to finding out how is this actually impacting families and what their recommendations back to us are with regard of how much they can really handle and how well they're actually handling it. I know we have the best of intentions, but there's a reality on the other side of that, that some families, this is really more than they're able to cope with. 
Yeah, so you know, we did a survey um, of our families to find out their needs and we've been trying to run down and support our families, you know, all the way from principals giving me texts saying families are in this kind of crisis and me rallying um, support from the mayor and the city partners to help those families to really more of a coordinated effort with our school support team, uh, Andrea um, or Andrea Amador and her team providing mental health supports to the student and to the family and um, guidance around ABA supports for families during this time. Um, and so, and, and we've been also helping them get connected and online through Mark Racine's uh, team mm -hmm. as well. We have a helpline for families. Um, so we've been working on that. Um, there's a number of ways. I know that also they're doing um, parent university. So there's, they're just starting now to do more outreach uh, with families around remote learning and providing additional support. But I would say that the best um, support for families is going to come in the next phase and we'll be outlining that in the remote um, learning plans because that's the support that we're gonna write for students who are either tier two or tier three, meaning needing additional kind of intervention in the family. And they'll be working with the school's um, student support team to create success plans and, and uh, personalized learning a little bit more for each child in their family. And I think that's where it's gonna come uh, working with our social workers and um, counselors and psychologists and school personnel at the family level. And then we'll rally support out um, for, for those families based on what they need because everybody has a unique need. Mm -hmm. But what do we say to the family who says, it's just too much? Yeah, I can't, I can't, you know, their families, you know, their kids doing their homework in the back of cars because parents are working, you know, driving to deliver food or other things themselves. So how are we really, I mean, our, you know, it's, we know our family situations are very diverse and probably have significant more struggles than many of the middle-class suburban families do, but our expectations are the same versus their own capacity and ability to even focus given all the other things they're concerned about. I guess trying to figure out how do we take into consideration the adult needs, the reality of that, and our desire to educate kids all at the same time. Where's the release valve for any of these pressures? The, I think you know, you're asking the 24,000 question or whatever they call that. Um, I think this is the hardest thing for us, especially with our students um, who have disabilities and parents who have depended on um, those services, those face-to-face in-person services to be delivered at school. And it's just been a dilemma for us with the sheltering in place order um, and not being able to provide those uh, supports to families. So we know that that's um, hard, but we have tried to really support with telehealth um, supports. We've tried to um, beam in, so to speak, uh, occupational therapy and physical therapy and opportunities as we uh, can and as it's available for the family. Um, that's the best we can do given the social mm -hmm. distancing um, at, the po at this point right now. And then I guess the other piece then is where we do see learning loss and try to mitigate that during our summer school planning if it's possible, if we have any release on the social distancing to be able to look at our plans for the future and how we might be able to help accelerate some of the loss we might be seeing. Okay, thank you. But we have to, we, I think we just, the best answer is to, we have to do it one by one because every yeah. family is very, very uniquely experiencing this pandemic mm -hmm. um, and there's no one solution for all families. And so that's why we're instituting as part of our remote learning plan, um, a part that uh, calls for school leaders to hold a student support team meeting with the professional support professionals so that we can uh, one by one support our students who are most in need. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for those questions, uh, Ms. Robinson. Uh, Mr. O'Neill's up next. Um, and before we um, turn it over to Mr. O'Neill, uh, Ms. Sullivan, would you please recognize uh, Dr. Coleman has joined uh, the, uh, the meeting and you can record his attendance. Yes, welcome. Mr. O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Superintendent. And um, those numbers you're reporting on food are incredible uh, because if you know, for so many of our students, it's the main meal that they have. And so um, thank you for uh, you know sharing with me places to visit this week. I did go to East Boston High School yesterday and the 
um, the Condon and the uh, Frederick Pilot School today and you know, met with the teams they are putting it out. I do want to give a particular shout out as well to Katie's Closet, the nonprofit that is working with so many of our schools because they are actually providing toiletries, uh, personal uh, needs for our young men and women. So everything from toothpaste and uh, body wash to deodorant and, and, and personal hygiene needs. Uh, and once that's a week and, from the students. At I'm BSAC. sorry. BSAC students suggested that we do that. Well, thank you to the BSAC for suggesting it because I was very impressed to see that at each of the locations as well. The other thing that surprised me, quite frankly, and I was very appreciative to find out, is how many teachers are picking up meals. Uh, I, I noticed that in East Boston from a lot of the elementary schools that come to the high school to pick up to then drive and deliver to the families as well. So um, thank you for that. I did want to touch base, Superintendent. I, I know you have, as you said, we just got the new guidance from DESE about remote learning. 1.5, we'll call it, it's not quite 2.0. I know you're pushing forward, you're, you're in the middle of a tremendous amount of planning with your school leaders. I'm wondering if you could give us some expectation on when uh, you feel you will have more firm communications around one coordinated schedule so parents can have a better sense from school leaders about what the expectation is for their child for the coming week. There's a lot of frustration now, as you well know about this teacher says, here's the Zoom password for this class, and here's the Zoom password for that class, and the parents are kind of pulling their hair out right now. So I believe you're working on more coordinated schedules. So one, what is the time frame can parent, that parents could expect to hear that? And two, um, when, do, when are you anticipating having more guidance regarding uh, grading for the remainder of the year? And also for our high school seniors, uh, what are the plans gonna be around uh, graduations more, I, I know you're still talking with the school leaders, trying to figure, get consensus, just more, what is the expectation of when parents and, and students can, can look forward to getting answers to those uh, key things that are facing them now? Yeah, thanks, thanks for those questions. Um, all of the remote learning plans, we're going to share those final plans with school leaders. So those should be out um, next by Monday for sure uh, for, par for parents. And they've been working on their master schedules to avoid any duplication and that sort of thing. Um, of course, you know, the series of events was to get the MOU approved first, then from there, get the DESE guidance, which we got on Friday night, um, and then to revise and just refine our um, already good work done by our academic office on our remote learning plan. And um, they had been meeting for several weeks. And then we brought it to our school superintendents and our school leaders. And we've been making some adjustments, especially on the grading side which is a piece that um, we had to really negotiate how that was gonna work, um, given you know, the unique nature of, of the situation that we're in. And so we anticipate grading, um, master schedules, information about um, the student support team and information about um, student success plans um, and how that's gonna align to the prerequisite, prerequisite standards that the um, commissioner put out on um, Friday night. So um, that should all be clear by the end of the week or early next week. And then in terms of high school graduation, um, uh, both Dr. McIntyre and uh, Dr. Brueggemann have been working with the headmasters on graduation. And also I've been talking to the BSAC members and it appears that the general uh, consensus is that they would prefer an in-person graduation. And so we're gonna wait as long as we possibly can and hope that we are um, not sheltering in place and that we can figure out how this might be possible either late in the summer um, even people said they would try to do Thanksgiving if they did it, you know, at Thanksgiving time. So um, we're still looking at the in-person option. However, we are working on a pretty special recognition for the entire class of 2020. And I don't want to give about too many details, um, but we're working on um, some some ways to recognize and acknowledge this incredible milestone of our seniors. Um, so I, it's, we're working on those plans, but I don't want to give them away yet. Okay, great. So just make sure I heard you properly. Um, as far as uh, when more coordinated schedules and information of grading will come out is probably next week. The Friday night you mentioned, I think, was actually when we got the guidance from the commissioner last Friday night, right? Yeah, we got it Friday night. So we've been finalizing all of our pieces. And I know the team was working furiously just today 
So the, it's just um, getting it to our school leaders then. We normally have our call with them on Fridays. I know that there's a headmaster call, I think, tomorrow. Um, and so we will um, finalize some of those decisions and then either late Friday or early next week, probably we will um, be getting those plans out because we're starting our remote learning on Monday. Okay, and just as a one quick follow up on that is, um, as we do have a number of autonomous schools in BPS, has it been a, are we gonna have more of a coordinated approach on these, particularly around grading and that type of thing, or, or schools kind of marching to their beat of their own drummer if they are pilot or innovation or in-district charters, so to speak? I would say that the, um, I would say that the um, reason that we're having these big discussions is because everybody has really marched to their own beat for a while and we really are trying to be much more coordinated um, and unified in this approach during this time. And um, so I think that that is going to be the expectation. So it's ever in the remote learning plan is something we're all agreeing to. And I think that's what's taken a little bit longer to negotiate those conversations to make sure it was very collaborative. Um, and so um, we should have more information for, for everyone early next week for sure, if not earlier. That's great. Thanks, Superintendent. And I do hope the school leaders of, you know, that do have more autonomy are um, you know, trying to work towards a common path. I think particularly around grading and everything, this is a really important time for us to have consistency across the district. So I hope they're um, having the same uh, spirit of collaboration that uh, you're trying to bring to it as well. Thank, thank you. you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. O'Neill. And um, just to add on to um, some of the conversations that we've been having with respect to the end of the year and honoring our uh, graduates. Um, uh, it's bittersweet uh, because we were, um, we always look forward to honoring our uh, valedictorians each year. And um, we had a new partner this year uh, to honor the um, uh, valedictorians. We were looking forward to the Red Sox hosting us uh, at the EMC club uh, at uh, Fenway Park uh, in late May, but um, we'll, uh, we'll have to do that next year. Um, and we um, will look forward to uh, uh, that partnership in the future. Um, but we do have, on the bright side, uh, plans to figure out some sort of way to honor those valedictorians uh, virtually. And uh, we have a number of partners that typically underwrite uh, that event each year um, that have uh, committed funds to us uh, that we can use uh, for a variety of purposes. Typically, we give the valedictorians some sort of financial um, support uh, as they go off to college, you know, typically a gift card to go to Target or something like that. And we're looking forward to, uh, through the uh, generosity of, um, uh, of these donors uh, to be able to do that once again. Uh, I know BSAC had also reached out and was looking to find a way to honor um, their graduating seniors and we're looking forward and to figuring out a way to do that. Uh, other members, um, do we have uh, questions or comments for the superintendent? Okay, uh, just making sure that I, I get everybody here. Uh, looks like no further comments or questions. So um, with that, I'll entertain a motion to approve the superintendent's report as uh, presented. So moved. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Is there a second? Second. Uh, thank you, Mr. Tran. Uh, is there any discussion to, or objection to that motion? Hearing none, uh, Ms. Sullivan, will you please call the roll? Dr. Coleman? Yes. Dr. Coleman? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Dr. Rivera? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Tran? Yes. Ms. Oliver Davila? Ms. Oliver Davila? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Lacanto? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, very good. Moving on now, uh, before we get to public comment, uh, this is, um, uh, we have one meeting each month where we ask our student representative, Ms. Evelyn Reyes, a senior at uh, the O'Brien School, who we're hoping will uh, share with us very soon uh, where she might be going for college next year um, to present her uh, monthly report. Uh, Ms. Reyes. Thank you, 
Um, so good evening, everyone. Uh, earlier this month, BSEC members met with high school superintendents, Dr. Brueggemann and Dr. McIntyre, um, as well as the three headmasters from the exam schools to discuss the differing workloads faced by high school students from across the district. Um, we were able to ask some questions and provide some suggestions on how to move forward around making that more, or looking, making it so that students can handle that workload a little better. Um, during school vacation week, BSAC students participated in a virtual town hall with various other organizations from across the city. The mayor, the superintendent, and Representative Presley were all able to speak at the forum. And in that time, students had a chance to reflect on all the changes that this time has brought upon us and share personal testimonies related to the situation. Um, BSEC members also took the time to be part of a training on phone banking and what we can now call remote lobbying. Um, and we, both members from BSEC and from the student cabinet, also had the opportunity to meet with the commissioner of elementary and secondary education last week. And in that meeting, we asked for clarification around the memorandum of understanding between PPS and DESI, as well as information about the impact of the crisis on MCAS and what grading might look like for terms three and four. Um, looking forward, we continue to meet weekly with the superintendent, and I'm sure that she can attest to the fact that we grill her for, every, for information every time. Um, and also in regards to college, plans i can share those now but i will be attending columbia university next year <laughs> and that concludes my report thank you thank you great well that's excellent that's incredible news uh miss reyes uh really uh congratulations and um we wouldn't expect anything less from you of course um but um i, I think we're all probably deeply envious of um you know the prospect of getting to move to uh, morningside heights and um, spend the next four years at Columbia. So congratulations. That's that's a, a testament to your uh, your efforts and your uh, your focus. And um, we know you're going to go and do great things. Uh, members, do you have uh, you. further you. questions uh, or comments for uh, this the uh, student representative? Great work. Congratulations. Great work. I just, I, I'm, I'm blown away. I'm so happy for you, so proud of you. And it's been an honor to work with you. You have really pushed our thinking hard uh, for two years now. And you've done a, a, brought such credit to BSAC overall. And Columbia doesn't know what they're getting. <laughs> <laughs> I, wish, I, wish that, I wish them well. <laughs> <laughs> they're a very lucky university. Uh, I just want to say felicidades. Estoy muy orgullosa de ti. And um, I also wanted to say that we uh, had, was it last week, Evelyn, or the week before? I don't know, all the weeks are melding into each other, that you facilitated a conversation. Mm. Uh, and you were amazing. So uh, I agree with uh, Mr. O'Neill. Columbia doesn't know what they're getting. So we're, we are really, really proud of you. So congratulations again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vice Chair. Thank you, Mr. O'Neill. Uh, are there other questions or comments for uh, Ms. Reyes? Well, hearing none, congratulations once again, and thank you for uh, the update. Thank you as well for the work that you've been doing um, in uh, the advocacy world. I, I know we, uh, we mention it quite often, but this is work that's um, helping to fill the gap and, and build the, uh, the civic uh, uh, spirit for our next uh, generation. And so we really appreciate that. Um, that spirit moving forward and um, we know you won't be a stranger. <laughs> uh, we'll move on now uh, to uh, general public comment, Ms. Sullivan. Sorry about that. There you go. <laughs> the um, public comment period is an opportunity for parents, students, and other concerned parties to make brief presentations to the school committee on pertinent school issues. Questions on specific school matters are not answered at this time, but are referred to the superintendent for a later response. Questions on specific policy matters are not answered at this time, but may be the subject of later discussion by the committee. 
Those who require interpretation services will receive an additional two minutes per person. Speakers may not reassign their time to others. Large groups addressing the same topic are encouraged to consolidate their remarks or select a spokesperson to provide testimony. Written testimony is appreciated and encouraged. Please state your name and affiliation before you begin. And I'll also ask people to just make sure that you please sign into Zoom using the same name that you use to sign up for public comments. And that will help us to identify you um, when your turn arrives. Um, we'll begin this evening with Michael Heishman. He'll be followed by Matt Cameron and Robert Jenkins. Ms. Sullivan, thank you. And uh, as we are uh, inviting Mr. Heishman into the room, I just um, want to take a, a couple uh, uh, seconds to note a few things. First of all, thank you to all the folks that uh, joined us at uh, last uh, school committee meeting to speak on the student privacy policy uh, presentation um, and proposal from the district. As we mentioned at that last meeting, um, we have asked uh, the district to go back and work on that proposal uh, a bit more um, and bring a few other uh, issues um, into uh, that proposal that uh, were raised by committee members in our um, very long discussion on that proposal, as well as the um, uh, uh, voluminous feedback that we received from the public. So uh, we had reached out earlier today uh, to a number of the folks that had signed up to speak about the privacy policy. Um, the privacy policy is not on the agenda tonight um, and we, uh, the district's not ready to come back with a revised proposal, but they are planning to go and speak to a number of the community groups uh, that have expressed uh, interest in this issue prior to bringing a, um, a, uh, a revised proposal to us once again. So I thank those that uh, had signed up to speak on uh, the privacy policy for um, uh, uh, pulling themselves back and, and waiting for um, either a meeting with the superintendent and her staff to speak about the issue or for a future meeting when we do have a revised proposal back on the agenda. I also wanna just take a, a further uh, moment to note uh, that uh, a number of folks signed up to speak about um, individual uh, personnel matters. And I want to take a moment to remind folks that we're a policy making body. Uh, we don't uh, get involved in uh, individual uh, personnel matters uh, with the district, nor do we uh, engage in any discussion about uh, individual personnel uh, decisions of the district. Uh, that's, um, that's operations and that's what the superintendent does. And so I'd ask uh, anyone that might be remaining uh, on the list this evening that was intending to speak about individual uh, personnel uh, decisions of the district to uh, choose your um, uh, your words and, and please uh, maintain the appropriate confidences uh, regarding uh, personnel records and um, and employment matters in the district. And with that, uh, Mr. Heishman, uh, I, I see you're on the line. Please uh, join us and, and begin. Thank you. Uh, Evelyn Ray's Mazel tov. Evelyn, congratulations. That's wonderful news. Uh, I know that the school privacy item is not on today's agenda. However, I feel compelled to say something very positive about the school committee, which I don't often, often do. I was very impressed with your strong stand against the school department's proposal at the April 15th meeting. You had listened to our testimony and listened to the community. Thank you. Since April 15th, I'm glad to hear that Mr. Glocano just said that uh, the school department is going to meet with the community. Um, well, right now, I currently support the Learn Without Fear proposal by SIM and the Unafraid Educators. It would be much, much better if there would be an agreement with the school department and the community about this proposal. Once again, I wanna speak against the MOU signed by our superintendent and the DESE. It is shameful that the DESE has come in with their plan to impose control over 15 of our public schools. And this is very important. Without any prior public input, for excellent reasons, our school department and community's attention has been diverted to survival issues. How long had this agreement been negotiated between the superintendent and, uh, and uh, DESE? This was done before the uh, schools were closed. Uh, this, this, this proposal was signed before members of the, this, this uh, policy, this, this uh, very important public decision 
was made before it came before the school committee and the public. We did not have an opportunity to discuss this issue before the document was signed. The Commonwealth is part of our problem. They have failed to provide the necessary resources that our school system needs. Let them do their job. They provide the necessary resources and we'll do our job, which is to provide a quality education for all of our children. Thank you, Mr. Heishman. Sullivan. Thank you. Our next speaker is, is Matt Cameron, and he'll be followed by Robert Jenkins and Leo Wu. Is Mr. Cameron with us? Ms. Sullivan, as uh, Mr. Cameron's joining us, I just wanted to, um, we don't typically address um, public comment, but I did want to just uh, take a note. First of all, thank you, Mr. Heisman. It, it was kind of you to um, speak highly of uh, the school committee. Um, I did want to point out just two um, specific items that were in your testimony regarding the um, uh, MOU that the district has signed with DESE. Uh, it's been a frequent theme that I've seen in criticism about the uh, MOU and it's inaccurate. Uh, one is the issue uh, regarding the kaleidoscope schools, the, the group of 15 that you noted in the, uh, the MOU. Uh, that is not a state takeover. Uh, the kaleidoscope, as um, uh, Dr. Caselli has uh, described in her presentation last week, mm -hmm. or excuse me, the last meeting, uh, is a professional learning com uh, community. It's for um, intended for professional development. It is not a state takeover. Um, secondarily, um, we are, as a body, going to take a vote on um, the MOU at a future meeting. We've made that clear in, in previous meetings, and I want to make sure that the public is aware of that. Uh, so thank you for bringing that uh, to the fore once again. Uh, Ms. Sullivan, has um, Mr. Cameron joined us? I believe so. We have someone identified as Matt. Is that Mr. Cameron? Mr. Cameron? Let's unmute Mr. Cameron. Uh, sorry, this isn't, this is a different Matt, sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Could you give us your last name, please? Sorry, this is, I'm not signed up to testify. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, thank you for letting us know. Um, Mr. Jenkins is not with us either, it appears. So we'll okay. move on to Leo. I'm sorry? Leah Wu? Is Ms. Wu with us? Hello? Hello. Uh, this is Leah Wu. Hi, welcome. welcome. Uh, how are, hey, how are you? Um, because I didn't have translator for me, I tried to my best for English, okay? Yes. So I have few is requires. The first is um, required to ex extend this sum, uh, semester to the end of July. Uh, the second requires summer school to teach uh, the teacher uh, uh, come back to teach our uh, the class the classroom. I mean the student. Number three required to stay school, uh, uh, start school earlier in August. So this, uh, we need to require the, the school is uh, earlier in August. Number four, require our student in public school for stay one more year in the same grade. Number five, how to uh, raise the special education student in fifth grade for this year. They are staying for one more year, stay for fifth grade or uh, going to sixth grade. This is very hard to special uh, student. Um, so uh, my English is not that good. I'm surprised because two days ago, uh, I applied for the uh, translator to me for today the meeting, but you know it's it is, it's hard to um, because we suppose uh, have translated for me today, but it doesn't have it. I'm um, so surprising today, you know, and um, I try my best. Thank you. 
Thank you. Well, Ms. Wu, thank you very much. And uh, we appreciate you trying your best. Your message has certainly been received and, and we appreciate that. And um, if you would like to return uh, to speak at a, at a future meeting, uh, we will uh, make every effort to uh, get a, a translator available for you. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. Next uh, speaker. Thank you. Um, when I call your name for public comment, if you could please try to virtually raise your hand, that will help us identify you in our list. Um, Emiliano Falcone, Diane Serrano, and Clara Ruiz are our next speakers. Is Emiliana Falcone with us? Yes, can yes. you hear me? Yes, welcome. Good evening. Uh, my name is Emiliano Falcone Morano. I am the policy counsel for the Technology for Liberty program at the ACLU of Massachusetts. On behalf of the ACLU and our more than 10,000 members and supporters in Boston, I submit this testimony in support of the Learn Without Fear draft policy proposal related to Boston Public Schools and Boston Police Department information sharing practice. Uh, I know that they, I received their email that uh, uh, this was not on the item, but I feel we feel compelled uh, nonetheless to testify about this issue. So we at the ACLU believe that Boston Public Schools must be safe and welcoming places for all students, no matter their immigration status. Students shouldn't fear going to school would result in their information being shared with ICE. Unfortunately, policy and practice fail to create the safe learning environment for our students. For example, at least one East Boston High School student was deported after the Boston Public Schools shared information about him with the BPD, which shared it with ICE. The policy drafted by Learn Without Fear protects students' privacy and prevents unnecessary sharing of information between Boston Public Schools, Boston School Police, Boston Police Department, and ultimately ICE. There are five main ways in which the policy accomplishes this. First, the draft policy provides that a Boston school police officer can only create a student report in four serious situations. These are when serious bodily harm to an individual has occurred as a result of will willful conduct by a student, a true and credible threat to the safety of the school arises that would amount to criminal conduct, a student is in possession of firearms, or a student unlawfully possesses or uses an uh, controlled substances provided those substances are not marijuana, nicotine, or alcohol. Additionally, these reports, as defined is in the draft policy, cannot contain information related to immigration status, ethnicity, national origin, or similar categories that may be used to harm students. Second, the draft policy provides for strong protections regarding how and when these students' records can be transmitted to the BPD and other entities outside Boston Public Schools. For example, both Boston Public Schools personnel and Boston School Police officers will be prohibited from sending information related to students to the Boston Regional Intelligence Center. Third, the draft policy has very important transparency and communications provisions. Under them, students, families, school administrators, teachers, and counselors must be made aware of this policy by including a copy of the policy in the guide to Boston Public Schools. Fourth, the draft policy has critical accountability provisions. To begin with, it mandates that superintendent create monthly reports containing, among other information, the number of student reports created and the outside agencies who access them. These monthly transparency reports must include a description of the demographics, that is race, gender, age, and grade of those students included in the reports, and reference which one of the four types of incidents I mentioned above was the basis for the report. Mr. Falcon? Yes, one, uh, yes, one, one more sentence, sorry. Okay. Ultimately, the advocate's draft policy provides necessary limitations to the kind of information sharing that can occur originating from the Boston Public Schools. This draft policy is a necessary step towards the dismantling of the school to deportation pipeline that currently exists in the city of Boston and that is so harmful to our immigrant communities. The ACLU of Massachusetts respectfully, respectfully encourages the board to implement the draft policy so that BPS students can learn without fear. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, the following people could please virtually raise your hands. Diane Serrano, Clara Ruiz, yeah. Elizabeth Badger, and John Mudd. And we'll begin with Diane Serrano. Is Diane with us? Clara Ruiz. 
Ms. Ruiz? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Hello, my name is Clara Ruiz and I'm a student at Bunker Hill Community College. Unfortunately, you won't be hearing from Diana Ves, from Diana Ves Serrano tonight and other folks that signed up tonight due to an email early today that limited the amount of people testifying on the issue of student privacy policy. It is disappointing that after the effort and time people took to work on their testimonies and prepare for a discussion that it continues, whether on the agenda or not, now, that, now they are told last minute to hold on those testimonies until further notice. The issue of BPA is allowing information of undocumented immigrant and other student information to reach eyes and other agencies through database months in. I am passionate about this topic, not only because I'm an immigrant myself, but also because I know what it feels like to live behind the shadows and uncertainty. I, um, I understand what law informant is required to keep students safe, but I don't understand why student information like ethnicity or background are leading to this student being discriminated against and profiled when it's, it is obvious that there are things that are happening that are bigger and more important. The school should be a place where children feel safe and where making a mistake doesn't lead to getting stuck into the school to prison pipeline. The school should be a place where students and faculty or staff are helped to become better individuals. It is unfair that because of your lack of status or, or racial background, you are isolated, judged, and forgotten. I am faithful. I am a faithful believer that school should be a safe place. BPS keeps saying that this policy takes care of concern. On page three, one of the paragraphs attempt to address what incidents are under BPD. Only homicide and sexual assault are listed. What are the other ones? This is very vague. It doesn't actually outline clear criteria that separates routine disciplinary matters from law enforcement matters. We need a policy where transparency, clear criteria, accountability, and over side is at the forefront. I want my nephews and future children to feel safe in public schools, to feel that the people who are guiding them want them to have a better future. We have to act now and pass a policy that is effective for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ruiz. Our next speaker is Elizabeth Badger. Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, um, Ms. Sullivan. If we could hold off just for a moment, I believe um, Superintendent Caselli is wanted to chime in on the, uh, the privacy policy issue. I do. I just want the public and, and the speaker to know that this is a really important policy for us all. And um, we want to have the right folks at the table. We want to be able to move this policy forward. Um, we are dealing with remote learning right now. We did promise that we would meet with this group. Once we get the remote learning up, we have uh, said that we would meet with them and we're also hoping because of the comments made at the last school committee meeting that it would be a whole policy with the access policy added to it. So having those two policies bringing together and, and um, into one uh, school committee for your review. And so we're still waiting on a few pieces, but I am committed to meeting with the group and we did ask them um, to meet with me in lieu of speaking so that we could get this resolved. Thank you, Superintendent. Ms. Sullivan. Thank you. Our next speaker is Elizabeth Badger. Ms. Badger with us. Hi, good, good evening. This is Elizabeth Badger from the PEAR Project. Um, in lieu of the comments that were made, I'm going to withhold my testimony right now. I just want to um, uh, welcome the committees speaking about the privacy policy with immigration legal advocates like myself who have been working on this issue for several years now. Um, so I'd appreciate if the committee members could reach out to us and include us in that conversation to share our experiences about working with Boston students impacted by the sharing of BPS reports. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Badger. Our next speaker is John Mudd. Mr. Mudd? Mr. Mudd, welcome. Ms. Mann, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. I want to talk briefly about the strategic plan and the district operational plan. Uh, in my view, I think the 2025 strategic plan is a thoughtful, ambitious vision. For those of us who have been working on these issues for many years, the fact that you place eliminating opportunity and achievement gaps as a number one priority is profoundly important. Thank you. It is a goal we can all share and take pride in. The plan recognizes and makes commitments in many critically important areas. For just a few, the comprehensive and district-wide professional development, 
teacher diversity, including language, literacy and culturally sustaining practices, teacher evaluation, accountability, engagement of youth, parents, and communities in school and district uh, decision making. As it stands now, we can all join in working towards the shared goals presented in the strategic plan. But the question of implementation is the central concern, as I and others have repeatedly stressed from the beginning of this strategic plan process. How will the district make a reality of these visions in schools and classrooms? Many of us have seen plans for many superintendents, but we haven't seen many changes in practice that actually reduce achievement gaps. The superintendent presented a district operational plan at the last school committee meeting. Unfortunately, as it stands, the operational plan seems thin in comparison with the richness of the strategic plan. There are many gaps. At this point, I think it would be extremely helpful if it could be clarified whether this document, this, uh, as it stands, the district operational plan is intended as an organic document that will be developed and elaborated in an ongoing process with the opportunity for stakeholder and community input into the plan as it develops. That is key. I would hope we would hear something in the, in the discussions later in the meeting. There are some immediate changes I would hope to see. One, ensure that the comprehensive district-wide professional development plan, which is assigned to human capital alone with a target of June 2020, will in fact include the professional development activities of all relevant actors, including academics, English Office of English Learners, special education, and the use of school professional development time in the BTU contract. Two, speed up the look bill planning with submission of new programs to DESE in January 2021. So the bilingual strategy superseding SEI can be implemented the next school year. Recognize the specified teacher diversity action steps are too little too late. And finally, include English learners with disabilities as a group to be addressed under special education reform and as a recognized subgroup for data reporting. Thank you again. Thank you, Mr. Mudd. If the following people could please virtually raise your hands. Rebecca Harbison, Jason Samaha, Ruby Reyes, and Michael Berger. Please raise your hands on Zoom. And we'll begin with Rebecca Harbison. Is Rebecca with us? Let me see Rebecca. Jason Samaha, is Jason with us? No. Ruby Reyes, is Ms. Reyes with us? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, hi, welcome. Thank you. Um, my name is Ruby Reyes and I'm the director of the Boston Education Justice Alliance. I want to again thank Dr. Caselius and BPS for supporting family needs during this pandemic. I also wanted to again request that the school committee ask for a supplemental budget from the city so that all schools can keep their staff for the coming year as they will be desperately needed as students return to classrooms. The response to the pandemic has been highlighting the needs, the need for employees who are the first to get cut in school budgets, including librarians, counselors, family engagement coordinators, and paraprofessionals. These positions have proven how important their role is in maintaining communication with families in order to provide resources and support. With families having to deal with so much more now, the district needs to develop foundational budgets that create givens regardless of enrollment, school assignment, or neighborhood. BPS needs to determine what a quality education is for every student in the district, district, then request that to have it funded. It should not take a public health crisis to realize how important these positions are and should become an embedded part of a school foundational budget. In addition to ensuring school committees, communities have what they need, Beja also requests that the school committee revisit the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education's Memorandum of Understanding signed on March 10th just a few days before the school closures were announced. The MOU is dangerous because there are few to no specifics in it. This vagueness has opened the door for state receivership in the future by including a section that stipulates that if BPS does not meet the DESE outcomes that were not included, then DESE can terminate the agreement with 30-day written notice. Mm -hmm. 
DESE does not currently have the capacity for a full receivership of a district as large as BPS, but they might have the capacity in the next three years. In addition to the vagueness, what the MOU fails to do is include the voices of parents, students, educators, and school communities. For example, is this experimental kaleidoscope network what Charlestown and East Boston schools need right now in the midst of a global pandemic? Is this what BPS needs right now in the midst of a global pandemic? DESE and BPS should not, have assigned, should not have signed this agreement in the midst of a public health crisis. The school committee needs to push for this MOU to be overturned or at the very least pause for the next two years as it has the potential to turn into full receivership as an already signed contract. In addition, Beja fully supports the policy developed by the Boston Teachers Unions, Unafraid Educators, and the Student Immigrant Movement in regards to student information sharing. Mm -hmm. They have developed a policy that has been vetted by attorneys and protects our children. Why is there such a delay in adopting this policy? Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Reyes. Could the following people please raise your hands virtually? Michael Berger, Kayana Lungalo, Sarah Sherman Stokes, and Gerald Gabo. Thank you. We'll begin with um, Michael Berger. Is Mr. Berger with us? I don't see Mr. Berger. Kayana Lunglo. Sarah Sherman Stokes. Gerald, Gerald Gabo, Mr. Gabo. Welcome, Ms. Cabo. Can you uh, can you unmute yourself, please? Any help there? Yes. Mr. Cabo. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. This is Gerald Gabo. I am a member of the uh, ELL Task Force and also a community leader in the Haitian uh, community, and I am. Uh, calling tonight to testify around the remote learning for Haitian children. And as you know, uh, English learners and their families, they are basically half of the BPS uh, community. And uh, our concern is that uh, all work should be designed with EL at the center, uh, not the other way around. And uh, what we realize is that most of the time, uh, we have to adapt to our EL uh, population instead of you know thinking about them to be at the center, and uh, the pandemic has basically revealed uh, so much the uh, disparity and the lack of integration that we have around our EL uh, communities, and that's one of the reasons why, for example, the Haitian community is really uh, suffering around the remote learning because there was no real plan. Uh, in place uh, before the pandemic prepared them for such a move. And as we look at the uh, strategic plan, we have some concerns uh, at the uh, uh, EL task force where we don't see any path uh, express how the district will go, will get beyond SEI. And as we know, with the look at implementation that is going to probably be delayed by one more year, so uh, we realize that there is little or no attention given to the native language as a priority or as a staffing concern. Uh, we look at the operational plan and there is no mention of ELS at WD level. And also there is not uh, uh, sufficient attention to system-wide multilingual, multicultural family engagement, which is a, an urgent need that has become ever clearer now with uh, the closure of the school and with COVID-19. So uh, my uh, uh, request for today is that uh, uh, parents should be at the center of any decisions in terms of how do we support them so that they can really serve uh, better the students and also uh, for us to take into consideration specific groups that are always behind in so many different ways around uh, BPS and the delivery method that BPS has uh, 
please. 20 seconds. Thank you. Oh. Thank you very much. Mr. Lacondo, that concludes our speakers for general public comment. Well, thank you once again, Ms. Sullivan, and thank you, uh, Ms. Cabot, and to all of our speakers this evening. Uh, we appreciate, as always, your input. And um, again, I, I want to express my um, appreciation for uh, those of you that have continued to give us feedback on the privacy policy. Uh, as you heard from uh, the um, superintendent earlier, uh, she, she'll be meeting, uh, she and her team, with a number of uh, advocacy groups. Um, I believe the superintendent had something further she wanted to say uh, with respect to uh, personnel matters as well. Um, and superintendent, I believe you'll be bringing um, a full list of changes uh, that you'll be proposed, you're uh, intending to uh, implement for the upcoming school year with respect to uh, school leadership uh, to a future school committee meeting. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanna make a comment and thank the speakers who were gonna come in earlier today um, to speak to the school committee, obviously. And I think I've mentioned this before once when another school came um, to, um, you know, share with the school committee a decision that was being made, but hadn't yet talked to me about it as superintendent. And I would request that teachers um, bring um, issues to me first and then to the school committee to resolve them, especially matters that are not pertinent to the school committee, like personnel matters. I think it's really important that teachers um, talk to me. I have been uh, communicating with school leaders about some school changes. Either a school principal has been promoted or a school principal um, decided that they were leaving the district for family reasons or they're getting their doctorate um, or some other reason that a principal might be choosing to leave. And then there are just a handful of principals because we have 33 schools that we are really working on and there are transformation schools. They're in the bottom 10% uh, of schools across the state of the Commonwealth and we are going to be working um, very um, strategically with them. And so there are a handful of principal changes. I do uh, want to bring those to the school committee at the next school committee. Um, and I will talk to school um, teachers about those. Typically, I would have done that right after I talked to the school principal in person. But because we have COVID and we're in this environment, it's much more challenging and difficult to meet with full faculties in person, obviously. Um, but when we have the new leader uh, announced with the other moves, I will arrange for Zoom meetings with the schools to introduce the new leader um, and discuss why the decision was made the way that it was in those transformation where there is a move. So I just wanted to make that public, a uh, public record. I wanna thank the teachers for allowing me the opportunity to speak with them as a superintendent uh, prior to coming to the school committee. Well, thank you again, uh, Superintendent, and we'll look forward to that uh, uh, update at the next meeting. Um, so moving on now, um, our uh, agenda looks a little bit different tonight for those of you uh, fellow members, as well as uh, those of you in the public that are joining us uh, for this meeting. Uh, we have a few, uh, uh, three to be exact, uh, time sensitive items uh, pending. So the uh, committee is going to receive those reports now uh, and then vote um, immediately thereafter. And then later, in the meeting, we'll, re we'll return to one um, traditional report uh, that we will, uh, that includes an action item that we'll take an action on at a future meeting. So we'll begin now with the interim salary and non-personnel payments on external funds. Uh, for members and um, for uh, members of the public, uh, you recall that this is a typical um, uh, exercise that we engage in each year uh, where uh, we authorize the uh, district to expend certain funds before they have been received based on our um, understanding of uh, uh, money that is due to us uh, via um, grants or other uh, funding sources. So at this time, I'd like to uh, invite uh, Anu Jayanth, our Director of F uh, Federal and State Grants, uh, who has joined us uh, for this meeting to provide a brief overview of that request. And for members, uh, uh, you have that, uh, that request in your packets, and I believe that's been posted to uh, the website as well for folks that are following along at home. Ms. Giant. Good evening, Chairman LaPonte, uh, and members of the school committee. Um, as Chairman LaPonte said, this is um, an order that has been requested annually, and we request this at this time due to the delay in receiving external fund award letters and finalized budgets. These are grants that are projected to be awarded for FY21, and the request is to approve an interim salary payment for personnel that we pay from these external funds, as well as encumbrances for any non-personnel payments we'd want to make on these prior to receiving the actual grant award letters. 
Darn mute button. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Giant. Uh, open it up now to uh, members for any question or discussion. Uh, please um, raise your hand uh, or uh, note uh, that you'd like to speak in the chat. Going around, looks like uh, looks like no comments from members. Well, as I mentioned earlier, again, this is a uh, fairly routine uh, procedure for us. Um, and um, I do appreciate uh, the district taking the time to uh, update us on uh, these efforts. Um, I did want to just ask one question, uh, Ms. Giant, um, with regard to federal uh, grants, uh, do we have any expectation uh, that that outlook may change uh, in the short term here uh, for the current fiscal year? Or are we um, primarily concerned at this point with how the federal outlook is for the upcoming uh, fiscal year and academic year? So as of now, as per our conversations with the Council of Great City Schools, and Mr. O'Neill will know this as well, um, they have no indication that they'll be cutting any funding. So right now the projections that we have as, as we've laid out in this memo are flat funding as per what we got for FY20 as well. Very good, very good. Well, thank you uh, so much for that update. Uh, we'll be, um, if there's no further questions or comments from the members, uh, we'll be taking action on this request uh, in a short while later in this meeting. Mr. O'Neill, did you have something to add? I just want to uh, comment on that comment. Uh, I think the only indication is there may be a potential of increased uh, funding at the federal level if there is another um, CARES Act prior to a big stabilization act. It's a very, very outside chance, but as, as Machaya said, I think we're fine. Nothing's gonna be cut from the funding. The only potential is new funding coming in either now on a support basis or uh, more importantly, starting July 1st uh, for next year. Very good. Thank you again, uh, as always, for uh, keeping on top of all this, uh, Mr. O'Neill, through your work with the Council of Great City Schools. Uh, we'll move on to our next presentation, which is on the Memorandum of Understanding between the Boston School Committee and the Boston Teachers Union regarding remote learning. Uh, as a reminder to members of the public, uh, the school committee met um, briefly in public session and adjourned to executive session last evening uh, via Zoom to uh, discuss uh, in executive session this um, uh, proposal from uh, the district um, uh, for our consideration. Uh, and this is um, the, uh, the agreement that the, uh, the district and uh, the BTU has reached to um, implement certain um, uh, remote learning uh, changes uh, that affect the collective bargaining agreement between the teachers and the district and more appropriately, the, the school committee. Uh, so we're gonna turn it over now to our uh, acting director of, off of the Office of Labor Relations with the Boston Public Schools, Mr. Jeremiah F. Passan who has um, projected his screen and will walk us through a couple short slides and then we'll open it up to members for questions and comments. Mr. Chair, can I ask something really quick? Please. Well, first I wanna thank Jeremiah uh, for his leadership. Also, uh, Tammy Poost, who worked with him and the entire labor team uh, that went uh, and helped us with this as well as our academic team and so many uh, others who uh, contributed to this uh, document. Also, I wanna thank Jessica Tang and her uh, bargaining team who came to the table. It took a while to get it done, but we did get it done. And I think that we have a strong foundation moving forward for what we think is gonna um, provide for our students. And um, it is focused on students and getting students what they need during this time. And I'm just appreciative that we have this done and we can move forward with our remote learning. fit. So I just wanted to give those shout outs. Yes, and good evening, Chairperson Lacanto, uh, Superintendent Caselius, and committee members. Uh, as Chairperson Lacanto said, my name is Jeremiah Hassan, uh, Acting Director for Labor Relations. Uh, and I'm just going to give you a brief presentation on the interim memorandum of understanding that we've tentatively agreed upon with the Boston Teachers Union regarding its members' remote work expectations during school closure. Running through the timeline, even before Mayor Walsh announced the school closures, we had been in contact with the union about the possibility of closing, so and what would be expected of its members. Uh, so we started meeting fairly regularly during the closure period with the union. Uh, and then on March 25th, 
the governor extended the school closure beyond the initial April 27th date to May 4th. So the scope of our negotiations had to expand a little bit there. Uh, and then when it looked like it was gonna proceed through the end of the school year, I had expanded again. Um, but ultimately on April uh, 17th, we were able to reach what we believe is a fair uh, agreement with the teachers union. And here are some of the highlights. And the expectations focus on a uh, set 20 hour per week schedule, uh, which is pretty consistent across large urban districts that we looked at. We looked at LA, Chicago, some of the other districts, and everybody is kind of on that set 20 schedule. Um, but there's two things to notice that is different. One, that the agreement allows us to utilize our members up to their regular, regular contractual hourly day. Uh, so there is that possibility to go beyond uh, the set time. And then we also designated 15 hours of synchronous time that is really focused strictly on student instruction uh, because some of these other agreements that we looked at, uh, planning meetings, and school-wide meetings can aid into that time, but we really wanted to focus on student instruction. So that's why we agreed to the 15 hours where that has to be the primary focus. Uh, and in addition to daily instruction, uh, teachers are required to engage in substantive communication with each of their students uh, at least every three days. So that goes beyond just the, uh, maybe a class-wide, um, presentation or instruction and really reaching out to the individual students. Uh, we're also requiring each BPU member to engage in five hours of professional development beyond the typical professional, professional development that takes place during the school year, uh, focused strictly on the best practices in remote learning. We want our members to really be prepared to engage in this new type of learning that, that some of them don't necessarily have the skills uh, to do so. We think the five hours will get everybody up to the bare minimum. And then additionally, the, during the closure period, we're asking for a suspension of the uh, evaluation process, but we agreed with the union that we will still be holding members accountable for their performance and conduct during the closure through the school district's employee discipline process. So getting into the impact on the current contractual working conditions, uh, obviously the, the clearest uh, change is that everything will be performed remotely as opposed to in our school buildings. Uh, we're looking for our school leaders to create master schedules uh, for age appropriate to depending on the classes uh, for at least three hours a day again, but for certain situations that they can go up to the regular contractual hour for our PTU members. Uh, and as I mentioned, the evaluation process will be put on hold, but evaluators will be held accountable through the di employee discipline process. Uh, and at the end of the closure, we will be uploading uh, summary memos of each union member's performance during the closure so that they really will be held accountable to make sure that they're doing everything we need for them to do to provide the best remote learning experience for our students. And looking at the equity impact uh, of an approval vote, uh, BPS recognizes that the closings and moving to a remote learning system could potentially exacerbate some of the racial and other disparities across the district. So we really wanted to work with the union to mitigate the neg negative impacts of, on students of color, uh, students with special needs, English language learners, and other students that are from historically mo marginalized populations. So really we're asking for a vote to appro approve this MOU uh, because we believe it enables the district, uh, our teachers, and the school leaders to provide an effective remote learning plan for all of our students. So thank you, Chairperson Lecanto and committee members. Thanks very much, uh, Jeremiah. I know uh, you and Ms. Poost uh, worked quite hard alongside the uh, superintendent in um, bringing us to a uh, um, equitable resolution with our, our, our partners in the, uh, the teacher ranks. Uh, thank you to the uh, BTU and uh, President Tang as well uh, in their hard work in getting this done uh, in a way that um, maintains some uh, consistency with uh, 
the uh, the teaching day, uh, the learning day, and um, uh, allows the district to move forward uh, with its remote learning plan that will be uh, unveiled uh, next week and uh, discussed um, to a much greater degree at our next meeting. Um, so I'll open it up now to our uh, members for uh, questions and discussion, uh, noting again um, that we uh, we did meet in executive session for members of the public's uh, notice yesterday and had uh, extensive discussion about uh, this uh, matter. Uh, members, are there further questions or concerns? Let's start with Dr. Coleman. Let me get back in here. There we go. I, I, you know, this is, you know, nationally, this is an incredibly difficult situation. I want to commend uh, both the superintendent and, and BTU for uh, engaging in such difficult conversations about how to create clear expectations for teachers and families so that we can move forward uh, and provide them the support they need to succeed. So uh, this is very difficult. You know, I know that that um, I want to appreciate the work done to get here and I'm glad that we have some clarity and now we have to give full support to our one of our most precious resources, which is our teachers. Thanks very much, Dr. Coleman. Uh, that's much appreciated. Are there other members with uh, questions or uh, discussion on this proposal? Mr. O'Neill. Yes. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Hassan, for your uh, presentation. Just a quick question for you, please, on, on uh, two things. One, the timing of this, this is through the end of calendar year or up until next September? It, no, this is limited to the end of this, this school year. So the agreement would expire on the 85th, uh, 185th scheduled day so that uh, June 26th, I believe, is the expiration date on the agreement. Okay. And um, obviously, we don't know what's going to be happening with remote learning next year. So hopefully, we can use that as an opportunity of what we learn in this spring and then um, think about how to do it then. And could you just dig in a little bit more for me, please, on the financial implications? You did mention it briefly, but I'm thinking in terms of, for example, extended learning day schools, extended things like that. Just help me out with what the financial implications are that we could anticipate. So we are compensating our members, uh, our teachers, in accordance with their standard salaries for the time that we're closed. So if a teacher was performing in an extended learning school, uh, they will continue to get that differential for the school that they uh, are assigned to. And where we see, so we don't see a change in, or any additional costs. We may see a slight savings with some of our uh, stipends that cannot be paid out for work that will not be done in the closure. Um, but there are some responsibilities that we give teachers stipends that we are expecting the work to continue during this period. Um, but there, there will be no, we don't see an additional cost based on the remote learning, uh, but we are continuing to compensate our teachers based on their standard salaries for whatever school that they were serving in at the time of the closure. Okay, thank you. Uh, the reason I, I think this um, agreement is a good agreement is it provides a minimum level of um, teaching standard across the entire district that provides um, more clarity in particular for parents and students on what to expect and provides school leaders more guidance on how they can uh, get their, the, their teaching teams working together and providing consistency. The biggest feedback we have heard is even within a school, this teacher is doing phenomenal work reaching out and yet uh, another child in the same school may not hear from a, a teacher. So I think this provides a minimum expectation across the board. We all know that many, many teachers, the very vast majority are doing far and above uh, and beyond these levels, but to at least have consistency for parents and what a minimum standard is, I think is very helpful. So thank you for your work on this, both to you and to you, Superintendent. Thank you very much, Mr. O'Neill. We'll go next to Dr. Rivera. Hi, um, yes, so again, thank you so much for your work on this. Um, this is a question that I actually asked yesterday, but I really liked what Dr. Casolius said in response, which is 
uh, related to what uh, Mr. O'Neill mentioned around, you know, there's been teacher, some teachers been more active than others or more engaged than others. And the fact that the performance evaluations will be on hold or on pause um, during this time, uh, understandably. Um, but if you could say a little more about accountability though, and because that, that was also a concern I had about how, how we're going to make, you know, sort of have all teachers engaged, including physical ed and arts, you know, um, how are we going to, um, you know, check in with making sure that all the teachers in a school are, are engaged with the students. Yeah, so that's a great question, Dr. Rivera, and I appreciate you raising it again. You know, I think that this is the big thing that we just heard, um, you know, and hear often is the experience is varied throughout the district. And so one of the reasons we have this uh, agreement and why we fought so hard was to be able to say that we had three hours of synchronous time and an hour of asynchronous time, meaning, you know, four hours total that teachers would be during the school day um, working on the instructional preparation or direct instruction with students or peer-to-peer -peer, um, sharing of best practices through their professional development or working with their school leaders. This can be done, you know, one-to-one -one with a student in small groups with a student or for a whole classroom of students. And so there's varied ways um, that, that we know our teachers are going to be interacting uh, with students around their work. We're going to be on the back end collecting data um, and so we'll be sharing that data out. We've already provided some of that um, to our equity roundtable with, you know, just kind of looking at some really simple data, but we do think this will become more robust in the type of way that we give out data over the next weeks as we begin to understand better who is and who is not um, uh, participating and, and had the opportunity or an equal opportunity to the educational materials and, and the engaging in them, whether it's signing onto their Google Classroom or signing onto Clever, or whether it's taking attendance. Um, and, and then um, these master schedules that we're expecting our principals and our school leaders to have as they monitor um, and do their work of monitoring almost like classroom walkthroughs when you're in a, a real um, uh, school building. So those are the ways that we are gonna be holding our staff accountable um, to, to these agreements and our school leaders will be helping us with that um, in the remote learning and more of that will become evident when we show you the remote learning plan and provide for you some um, early data on what we're seeing. Looks like you're all set, uh, Dr. Rivera, and thank you for your question. Um, looks like uh, uh, Vice Chair Oliver Davila has a comment. Yeah, sorry, I couldn't, I can't find the raise your hand thing. Um, uh, I just, I, I said this yesterday, it's a comment more than a question, um, but please feel free, free to respond. I think um, just making sure that our families understand what this means, um, synchronous, asynchronous, I mean, unless you're in this conversation, you're like, what does that mean? Um, so I would just say, if we can communicate with students and families very specifically what this means for them and how this actually rolls out in their day-to-day -day life, um, I think will just be really, really important so that, you know, we, we, so that families know exactly what the expectations and, and students as well. So I just wanted to say, I think I said that yesterday, but I think it's really important, um, especially during this time when families are just you know, many of our families are just trying to get by. There's a lot of challenges right now. And so I think we just wanna be really sensitive um, and share exactly what, what this means. Um, but I, uh, I also just wanna say, um, you know, that I think um, based on my understanding um, that this is an agreement that is, is very good when we look across the country um, so I do want to say thank you to all the people that worked on this, um, the BTU and the superintendent and the superintendent's team. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Vice Chair. Um, I just want to thank you for those comments and it's a good reminder and that's why we built in the student support team process as well so that we could personalize. It gets back to Ms. Robinson's question earlier, you know, how are you going to adjust for families and based on what they need? 
and uh, what they can actually do right now. I mean, a lot of families, you know, are just trying to get by. Um, and so we are, we are cognizant of that and um, school leaders will be able to adjust with that, with these um, learning plans and these success plans that they're gonna be working up uh, and individualized for each and every family and child who is having uh, difficulty. Very good. Uh, thank you, Superintendent. Thank you once again, Vice Chair. Uh, I see Mr. O'Neill has his hand raised again, but I want to go first to Mr. Tran, who had a uh, quick comment, and then we'll return to Mr. O'Neill and anyone else that wanted to add anything additional. Mr. Tran. Hi. Uh, this is more or less just a, a, a um, an appeal. I have raised the same issue yesterday, and I, I know that what I'm, I'm going to say may be in the purview of personnel issues. But uh, I'm just um, hoping that, uh, that, that I can appeal to the uh, superintendent as well as the office of, uh, of um, uh, 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 the office that deals with uh, students with disability. There are parents that are struggling and, uh, and the parents with uh, children with disabil disabilities struggle even more, you know, in this time of uh, public health uh, um, calamity. I'm calling on the Office of a, a Student uh, with Disability uh, to provide uh, special ed teachers <clears throat> and teachers that are dealing with uh, with uh, students with disability, uh, extra resources, maybe individual uh, um, uh, assistance, so that those teachers can uh, work together with the parents, because I have heard from many parents, as a matter of fact, that are dealing with issues of having their children with disabilities who are now at home and 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 could not actually learn or as a matter of fact take any kind of instruction through the remote uh, system so I, i'm i'm just advocating for uh, extra resources in terms of personnel in in helping those teachers so that uh, the students with disability can be better uh, assisted during this time Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tran. And, and Dr. Caselli, she spoke a little bit about um, the provisions in the MOU yesterday with uh, regard to paras and the work that they do, as well as our uh, coordinators of special education, the COSAs, um, and uh, the work that they're continuing um, to be uh, obligated to perform. And maybe you can uh, describe that a little bit more and expand on it, Mr. Hassan, as well. Yeah, so thank you so much for bringing that up, uh, Mr. Tran. I tell you, what, when I get asked what keeps you up at night, it's this very fact that we have several students um, who we know are regressing because they need the one-to-one, -one, uh, right? We know that, um, that they're having difficulty and that families are, are having difficulty because of the shelter-in order. We're unable um, to provide those face-to-face -face interactions with our kids in the minute that we can, we will, um, because we know that it's really important for their um, development and for their growth and for their later independence um, in life. So um, just know that that's a strong value and priority of ours, and, and we've had that front of mind. And um, we'll continue to work with our IEP teams, our COSAs, like uh, the chair said, and our uh, therapists that we have. I know they are doing telehealth. Um, they're doing some um, uh, virtual OT and PT uh, supports to families. And I think, again, this gets to what I was saying before about the individualized personal nature of one-to-one -one that it's gonna take in this type of environment uh, for our students. That's gonna take teachers getting used to that new style and our school leaders getting used to that new style because they're used to teaching to a whole group of kids and we need to adjust to one-to-one. Um, -to -one. And I gotta say, in my 32 years of being an educator and turning around schools, I've never seen the achievement gap closed unless it was a one-to-one -one personalized type of situation. Mm -hmm. And so we have the opportunity now to learn from one another, to build on our best practices, and then to continue to resource those the way that we need to 
in order to get our kids what, are, what, what they need. So I really much appreciate that, um, uh, that reminder and, and that value that you hold. We hold the similar. Thank you, Superintendent. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Tran. We'll go back to uh, Mr. O'Neill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And this is more of a follow-on question to the conversation between Vice Chair Oladavala and Superintendent Casilius about the evaluation issue. And Superintendent, it really makes me think when we tie this to this MOU and the guidance with the state and the work that you and your team are already doing, you're, you're kind of marrying the three together and coming out with the new remote learning where we're trying to move our students forward. The past couple of weeks have been more solving the issues, um, getting them technology, getting them used to it, trying to maintain a level of learning, but now we're trying to move them forward. And to me, it really begs the key question of, as a board member, I'm curious, how are we going to know if our students are moving forward? How are you building in a plan on that? And, 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 and if you'd rather have that conversation when we have a conversation about remote learning, since we're talking about the MOU now, it's just, to me as a board member, that is you know, the level I think we should be at in asking you, how are we going to know? And how are we gonna know if they're not? Yeah, so you know, it's basic good teaching and learning, which is what um, we're going to be engaged in now that we know we're going to be all year. And so that's how we'll know is because we're going to assess for learning. And so we know that we have these prerequisite standards that the, um, the commissioner put out on Friday night. So we are going to be working with our school leaders and our teachers around these standards. We plan on developing ways to assess learning both before and after the uh, instruction of the standards um, and providing regular assessments. And so we will be doing that and we'll be able to report that out. Um, we also know because we'll be monitoring their individual plans um, for students who are struggling the most. We say these are our tier two and tier three students who we know are having some sort of struggle either um, they weren't learning it or maybe they have something going on at the family and they need these additional supports and we'll do our best to put those in place um, however we can. But I think the most important thing is what you said at the very beginning and that is that we are aligning the work um, so that it makes sense. We will have parent friendly documents too, um, but we are aligning the work so it makes sense for people. Um, I know that little pieces have been leaking out so when the whole comes out, I think people will understand um, why we did it this way, which is aligning standards, having assessments, then doing intervention, um, and holding our SST teams and supporting and rallying around individual students, and then reporting it out to our uh, stakeholders. That's, that's what we should be doing. And so we're building a really strong foundation for moving forward, because if we are in this longer, and I do anticipate that we will be in this uh, potentially longer, or we may uh, have intermittent times where we have to um, shut down a school or multiple schools or the whole district. You just don't know, but we're preparing for all of it, right? Um, you wanna be ready. We don't wanna have to redo all of this again. We wanna have strong, high quality um, uh, plans in place so we never have to, and don't miss a beat for our kids ever again. And so these practices, I think, are gonna be carried into our new normal in the future, um, regardless. So um, thanks for the question. Are you comfortable this MOU puts you in a position to, to do that? I actually think our MOU is better than a lot of others that we saw around the three hours of time yeah. that teachers will be, um, you know, required to spend with uh, students or in um, synchronous time, yeah. uh, depending on what the master schedule is that the that the principal has uh, put together with input from the teacher. Um, I think that that puts us in a really strong position. Um, and one thing we didn't talk about is if there's a case where we need a teacher to work up to their duty hours, we also have that in our um, MOU. So, you know, where there's some flexibility and I want to thank the BTU for allowing us that flexibility to meet our students needs. And to the average person who's not quite up on educational jargon, synchronous, is it best to describe it as student facing time? Mostly it's student facing, but there may be uh, incidents where we have teachers who are um, you know, maybe a teacher creates a video on a weekend, right? And she uses, she exchanges time 
with that and the students engage with the a video and then they are um, facilitating that video and it's not necessarily instruction that she's actually giving at that exact time, but it's interfacing with um, other human beings. So synchronous is really meaning that you're interfacing with other um, people, either teachers, other professionals, or you're interfacing with students um, either through Zoom, um, through the other technology means like telephone or other ways. Okay, thank you, Superintendent. Thank you again, Mr. O'Neill, and thank you for uh, that uh, additional explanation, uh, Dr. Caselius. Let's go next to Ms. Robinson and then Ms. Reyes after that. All right. Yes, thank you. Um, I was wondering with this, because nowhere in here do we really mention parent engagement. And I was wondering, particularly as we're about to go into new learning and new material, is there an opportunity for teachers to have a parent conference? Not, I know that they're doing a lot of parent communication right now in terms of the logistics of getting the work done, but a, a moment of reflection to give parents feedback on where their kids are now and how they might be able to fine tune what they're doing or where to encourage additional work if it's not happening so that we're not waiting till the end of the year but this feels like it's about we're about to turn the page to the next mode of this work so to be able to give parents some feedback so that yeah. you can make the most out of this last period of the year yeah really. i mean parents are our partners now i mean i, I wrote a, a, a opinion piece um, about that yeah you know, uh, we always say kind of flippantly, oh yeah, parents are a child's first teacher, but they really are yeah. now. Um, and so uh, I have a healthy respect for them and what they're doing. And I can't thank them enough for being such good partners to help us with the continuity of the students learning at this time. So I'm asking all parents to for sure reach out to their teachers um, and to uh, regularly connect with them. I know it's a lot and they're balancing a lot, but this is really important for the children. You know, I often say children don't get a rewind you know, they only get this one opportunity at their education. And so we have to get it right. And unfortunately, they've been thrown into this situation at no, you know, nothing that they did, right? And so I'm, I, um, I plan on uh, having a lot more as we grow uh, uh, resources available for parents. Right now, it's been getting them food, getting them connected, you know, um, trying to find some of them, you know, um, and then understand better their needs and get, get them what they need. And then Monica uh, Roberts has been working on more of the parent advancement side. And we certainly can come back with more in depth reporting on what her team is doing as well. She sent me some notes today on what they're doing, but um, I think they're doing a lot and it probably is um, a better time for us to come with a much larger presentation around how we wanna think about family engagement in the future and how we can actually capture this moment to really learn uh, what this connectedness does. I mean, we have I think 120 people on this call, and I don't think we always have 100 people in the chamber. And so I think, you know, being able to be connected to our parents is really a great opportunity for us. Um, but we also want to be respectful of parents and their time as well. Um, so I'll, 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 I'll ask Monica, and if the chair wants, we can certainly come back and uh, present on what we're doing around family engagement and how this opportunity may help us to. Um, work with our parents better. Thank you. And I may have left it out of my highlights, but we did include uh, family communication and parent communication uh, expressly in a number of provisions in the MOU, uh, just because we really did want to emphasize the importance of keeping families engaged as well as the students. And of Thank course, you. part of that is also progress reporting. So, you know, we'll be doing progress reporting out to families on how their child's doing and grades and that sort of thing still. Very good. Thank you again for the question, uh, Ms. Robinson. And um, as the superintendent noted, I think uh, it would be uh, great. I know we, we heard from uh, other members, including the vice chair, on um, the value of uh, parent and, and family engagement uh, as part of the, the rollout for this remote learning process. And um, as we uh, await the, the district to come back at our next meeting to speak um, more about remote learning, I, I'd certainly hope that uh, that family engagement piece would be part of that uh, presentation. So uh, we do have one further comment from um, uh, Ms. Reyes, our student rep. Thank you. Um, I was wondering two things. Um, first, sort of what, if the expectation is for teachers to log the hours that they're doing or how 
they will keep record of those hours um, on their end. So I guess first, congratulations on Columbia. Uh, I know <laughs> Chairperson LeCanto mentioned the uh, feeling of jealousy amongst the committee. Uh, I also am a little jealous that I'm not the one going off to Columbia uh, in the fall. So enjoy it and make the most of it. Um, in terms of logging hours, so I think it, it's kind of a twofold approach to, to monitoring the hours of the teachers. First, the school leaders are going to be designing schedules for uh, student learning that will include the responsibilities of the teachers throughout the day and throughout the week. Uh, that's so one to keep it uh, to keep oversight of it, but also to make sure that teachers aren't conflicting with each other's uh, schedules, so that you know two zooms on at the same time. So there will be that type of oversight and monitoring of their hours, but there's also the fact that when we use all this technology, there's almost a digital footprint in everything that people are doing. So, you know, if we get a report that a teacher hasn't been living up to the expectations, uh, it'll be pretty easy to go back and check at what they're doing for office hours to their computer, uh, what, up, what they're uploading for programs and plans, uh, lesson plan videos, all of that. There should, it should be, um, like I said, a, a digital footprint of almost everything uh, you do through the computer, so. Okay, thank you. And I'm also curious about what the consequence of setting clear guidelines for teachers will be on student time. And I guess creating a master schedule sort of partly um, addresses that, but I'm wondering about extra work that teachers may be assigning or, you know, what, what the consequence of assigning these guidelines to teachers will be on, on students and their learning time. Um, I'm trying to understand your question, Evelyn. Can you say it again? Well, I suppose, um, do you mean like if teachers te give you seven hours of time on the computer or seven hours of screen time, what the consequences will be if they do that? Um, more or less, but I think more along the lines of if we're expecting teachers to sort of be interacting with students and or doing things related to student instruction um, for 15 hours out of the week, how will that balance out on the side of students? Like how will we be able to make sure that we can get to all of our classes and that sort of thing? Or like, is there a measure in place to address that? So we've asked school leaders to make a school schedule for students so that they can meet their standards and they can meet their obligations, especially for seniors with graduation. Um, and so we are planning on school leaders releasing those schedules for students. Um, we have recommendations on number of screen time, but that doesn't mean that students might not have a lot of homework. So it is school by school. Um, but uh, we don't think it's a good idea for students to spend more than half of what their normal day would be on the screen all day because we also want them to be doing other activities and connectedness with peers and then have time to actually do your homework when you get homework. So, um, and we know, you know, I've listened to BSAC on that. So when the remote learning guidance comes out, they'll have that and their school leaders are the ones who will uh, define those expectations, communicate those expectations to their school communities and then hold their teachers accountable for it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Reyes. Uh, are there further uh, questions or comments for the superintendent before we move on or for Mr. Hassan? Looking around, uh, I think everybody's had an opportunity to speak and I thank everyone once again for um, making time, of course, to uh, discuss this important issue uh, with the district uh, in an executive session yesterday, uh, as well as uh, thanks to uh, the superintendent, uh, to Mr. Hassan, to uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Poost, and uh, the entire team that worked um, dilig so diligently over the last month plus uh, to get this uh, agreement off the ground and pave the way for remote learning going forward. Um, thank you to, uh, once more to the BTU. Um, I understand the BTU is going, um, uh, uh, is, is all set to go on this MOU and we will take a vote uh, on it uh, just a short time later uh, in this meeting. Um, and uh, we will return to that shortly. Uh, so thank you once again. Um, we're going to move on to our next uh, agenda item, 
which is a resolution in support of increased uh, federal support and stimulus funding for public K-12 education. Uh, at this time, I'd like to turn things over to my colleague, uh, Mr. O'Neill, uh, who, as many of you know, also serves as a, a member of the executive committee of the Council of Great City Schools. He's currently the chair-elect and will be assuming the, uh, the chairman's role um, uh, this summer and has been working uh, quite a bit with leadership in Washington to advocate for <laughs> Uh, increased federal funding, not only for the Boston public schools, for, but, but for large urban districts and public K-12 education nationwide. Mr. O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Uh, so to my fellow members, what we have in front of us is a draft resolution uh, for us to consider advocating for more federal funding, uh, federal support and stimulus funding for education as these variety of uh, support and stimulus bills are going through Congress. Just by background, uh, 62 of the 67 superintendents, including Superintendent Casilius, uh, that are members of the Council of Great City Schools signed a letter this week from the superintendents uh, that was sent, in fact, uh, Ed Week, the National Education um, Publication, had a front page article about it today that uh, these large urban districts were requesting more funding, specifically, uh, the request is for $175 billion in education stabilization funds that would be distributed through the uh, Title I um, formula. Also, a $13 billion increase for IDEA, a $12 billion increase in the regular Title I funding, a $2 billion for E-rate, which allows uh, um, uh, internet access for students, and finally, some emergency infrastructure funding that would include school buildings. So the superintendent sent a letter to uh, their, uh, to the leaders of both the House and the Senate, a majority and minority on both sides, um, because by reference, the CARES Act that was passed last month included 13.5 billion for schools. And that was really just to start during the last downturn in 2009, the uh, Recovery Act, American Recovery Act, ARA, included 100 billion for schools, and then an additional 10 billion was done afterwards. So last time there was a downturn, the federal government provided 110 billion in additional funding for uh, K-12 districts. This time they've only provided 13.5, and quite frankly, the impact is potentially significantly worse than it was in 2009. Uh, the unknowns right now are what are going to happen to city funding and to state funding. Um, uh, they are all being decimated when you don't have stores open, when you don't have property being sold, when you don't have sales tax being generated. Um, state, uh, city and state revenues collapse. And when they don't have uh, revenue, they don't have income tax, et cetera, there are gonna be tremendous amount of cutbacks going on at city and state levels. Uh, if you read the papers now, you see a number of city and states are already starting to plan furloughs of 10, 20, 30% of their employees in various cities and states across the country. So with that in mind, the superintendents have sent a letter to the um, uh, leaders of the House and the Senate on the majority and the minority side. Based on a regular weekly call that the Council of Great City Schools facilitates with school board chairs, uh, uh, Chair Laconto, uh, takes part every week in a call with his peers across the country. Um, it was suggested that school boards also consider a resolution. San Diego passed one last week. Uh, the San, San Diego Unified School Board passed one last week. The council worked with it and changed it to a more of a generic resolution, making some of the requests that I just mentioned. Um, the chair and uh, some of the superintendent's team have taken that draft resolution from the council and personalized a bit more to some of the costs that Boston has already um, incurred. So for example, you see in the draft resolution, it talks about the fact that we are still paying all of our 10,000 employees, uh, that we've put out 300,000 meals, that we've put out 30,000 Chromebooks, that the city and the district spent 5.1 million on Chromebooks already, uh, that because of the food that we're putting out, some of which is not reimbursed, we're anticipating a $5 million deficit in that line item budget for this year. So there are a number of costs that the district has already incurred. And what we would like to do is uh, we have in front of us a draft resolution that both reflects 
the realities of what Boston has faced to date. It then talks about um, clearly what happens um, if school districts suffer, uh, what the impact is to our students, how they fall behind in wages in their lifetime, how they fall behind in achievement gap, even while in school, et cetera. And then from a solution as a specific ask for at least 175 billion in education stabilization funds, 13 billion for IDEA, 12 billion for Title I, 2 billion for E-rates, and the emergency infrastructure that to include school buildings. So it's proposed that we as a school board um, approve this resolution and I anticipate that a very strong majority, if not a vast majority of uh, council member district school boards are gonna be um, considering a resolution like this within the next week to 10 days as well. I turn back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much uh, for that um, expansive uh, um, background, uh, Mr. O'Neill. Uh, just for members, um, further uh, reference and for the, the public as well, um, the district, the, uh, the school committee doesn't typically get involved in uh, at this level of um, uh, advocacy at um, the state and federal level, except in uh, very uh, limited and extraordinary circumstances. And uh, for those of you that re recall, uh, we were involved um, recently at the state level on um, the Student Opportunity Act, as well as um, uh, as you recall, a few uh, further years ago, the question two on uh, expansion of charter schools, we took that action because it was in the interest of our district um, and uh, more importantly, and uh, for the students in our district. And we've done the same thing at the, uh, the federal level as well. Uh, as you recall, following Parkland uh, a few years ago, uh, we, took an F, uh, we took an initiative um, at the urging of our uh, uh, friends in BSAC uh, to pass a resolution uh, in support of stronger gun laws, particularly around uh, and inside of schools. Um, and so we have precedent here for taking action in extraordinary circumstances. And certainly there are, um, there's no more extraordinary circumstance than the one that's uh, facing us right now uh, as a district and as a nation, uh, as, a, as, a, as a planet. Um, and so uh, we, um, we appreciate the work that the Council of Great City Schools are do, is doing to um, advocate for uh, increased federal funds, uh, the work that they're doing with our, uh, our nation's uh, large urban superintendents, and the work that they are uh, um, doing to uh, coordinate uh, a similar effort from uh, school boards such as Boston. Uh, so I wanted to um, give you that further context for action uh, before we open it up to further questions and comments from the committee. Mr. O'Neill, it looks like you have one further item. Yes, just one more quick point to make. We in Boston are actually blessed with a congressional delegation at both the uh, House of Representatives and at the Senate level of people that who actually get this and are very supportive and push and quite frankly, are, are positioned strongly even from the Massachusetts delegation to have Chairman Neal as chair of the Ways and Means Committee as a Chairman McGovern, and McGovern as chair of the um, Rules Committee to have Senator Warren on the Senate Health Committee, which covers education. We actually do have a, a delegation that is uh, very sympathetic and pushes on this. And yet it is our responsibility as uh, you know, representing uh, the district uh, to make sure that um, the impact on our students is uh, top of mind to our congressional delegation as they go through this. Thank you once again, Mr. O'Neill. Are there questions or comments from the membership? Uh, please uh, virtually raise your hand, get my attention, or uh, use any other means necessary. Well, it looks, um, I'm looking around at all the members and it looks like uh, there are no further questions or comments. Um, you know, this is really uh, um, a, a simple uh, step for us, a no brainer, if you will, um, to, uh, to take this step and advocate um, for uh, increased federal funding, as Mr. O'Neill um, aptly put it, um, we've got our uh, our nine uh, congressional districts and our two senators, um, those uh, eleven uh, representatives in the delegation, soundly behind us in support of public education in Massachusetts and across the country. And so we're uh, we're definitely in good shape on this one. But nevertheless, um, this effort uh, puts us in lockstep with our 
um, our uh, brothers and sisters across the country. Um, I do want to take a moment just to thank our um, friends in um, intergovernmental relations at uh, City Hall and in the district uh, for um, uh, helping us uh, to um, take what the, the um, Council of Great City Schools has suggested. I believe this was based on a template uh, that was originally um, uh, orchestrated and passed by the San Diego Unified School District in California. And um, we've, uh, as Mr. O'Neill mentioned, uh, Bostonized it. Uh, we've um, added quite a bit um, in the uh, resolution to uh, indicate um, uh, that what um, uh, what steps we've been taking, and as as um, folks that might be following along, this is uh, resolution is posted on our website for your reference. Uh, we have expended a great amount of money uh, with um, the purchase of Chromebooks, twenty thousand new Chromebooks at the cost of five point one million dollars, as well as um, the five million dollar deficit that we're incurring to ensure that um, uh, the feeding of uh, all of our students and families uh, continues unimpeded during this time. Uh, so we're doing our best and we want to make sure that we um, can make uh, use of all available resources. Uh, so thank you once again, Mr. O'Neill, for um, uh, your work on this and for urging our uh, passage and getting this across the finish line. Uh, and we'll look forward to uh, taking action uh, in just a few minutes. Okay. Um, well, we're going to move on now to um, the uh, action items uh, portion of our uh, of our agenda, and um, this is moving back to our typical work um, where uh, we'll take a vote, um, we'll consider, and then take a vote on the grants for approval, uh, and then we'll move on to the items that we've marked up for uh, vote this evening. Uh, in addition to the three items that we just discussed uh, of an urgent nature. Uh, we'll also be considering a number of items that were um, the subject of reports at our last school committee meeting. Uh, so I, um, this can get a little bit tedious um, for uh, those of us that are participating as well as uh, watching at home. I think we still have about, uh, yep, 94 participants uh, down from about 160 earlier. Um, so you hearty souls, you're in for a lot of uh, yays and nays, hopefully more yays and nays. Um, but we're going to move on now and um, uh, move through our action items as uh, expeditiously as possible. So as I mentioned, uh, we're beginning first with our grants for approval, which total $175,363. I'll open it up to questions and comments from the committee and note that we do have uh, staff available to answer any questions. Are there questions on the grants uh, for approval? Looking around. Uh, have... Yes, Ms. Robinson. Um, yes, I just have a quick one. I noticed even on this one, one of our grants, even though the time period is now, um, while we are not in, in school, the question is, um, are teachers able to provide the, the support or the work that's needed to be done in order for the grants to continue? I know one, it, it didn't look like there had to be any, it was more of a training you know, piece than it was direct service to students. Um, so I'm, my assumption is if we are approving grants that would be taking place during these months, either that work would be able to be postponed till a time when you are back in session or the work is able to be carried on remotely. Yes, so for most of these grants, it is for work that can be continued on remotely. What we're also doing is we've been working with individual um, grantors to see where possible if we can get extensions on the grants. So we've had some success with that as well. One of the grants here, the BPS Moves Together, is a specific uh, COVID-related donation right. for a virtual PE program. But for the others, yes, so we're doing a combination of you know, can this work continue virtually? Um, and if not, are we able to get some kind of an extension on the grant period? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Are there further questions or comments? Ms. Oliver Davila, Vice Chair. I just wanted to say it's great to see the physical fitness um, grant in there um, and that it's going to be on BNN. And that actually, Brandy used to be my trainer, so she's great. <laughs> So I just want to say I really I really like that. I'm going to put my daughter, getting her to move is just, yeah, so it'll be really great. Yes, that was a very generous donation from Crown Castle. 
Other questions or comments, members? Well, hearing none, I'll uh, entertain a motion to uh, approve the grants as presented. So moved. Robinson, is there a second? Second. Thank you, Dr. Coleman. Uh, any discussion or objection to this motion? Ms. Sullivan, will you please call the roll? And members, as a reminder, please unmute your, uh, um, your microphones. Dr. Coleman? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Dr. Rivera? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Tran? Yes. Ms. Oliver Davila? Yes. Mr. Lacanto? Yes. The grants are approved unanimously. And thank you for that thumbs up, Ms. Reyes, as well. Mm -hmm. um, we'll move on. Uh, thank you, Ms. Sullivan. Uh, we'll move on to our next action item, which is the superintendent's request for uh, interim salary and non-personnel payments on external funds. Uh, which Ms. Uh, Giants presented on earlier this evening. As we noted earlier, this is an annual routine request. Uh, I believe we uh, uh, went through any uh, necessary questions or comments uh, earlier in the presentation, um, but I just wanted to take a, a quick moment to see if there are any further questions or comments from the committee. So looking around, hearing none, um, I'll entertain a motion to approve this grant as uh, presented. So moved. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Dr. Coleman, excuse me. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, uh, Ms. Robinson. Any discussion or objection to this motion? Ms. Sullivan, will you once again please call the roll? Dr. Coleman? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Dr. Rivera? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Tran? Yes. Ms. Oliver Davila? Yes. Mr. Lacanto? Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Well, thank you once again, uh, Ms. Sullivan. And um, if you'll bear with me just for a second, I want to make sure I'm not missing something uh, in my, uh, my list of items to uh, take a vote on. Um, nope, we're there. Okay, so pardon me for that interruption. Uh, our next action item is uh, the superintendent's final strategic plan. Uh, this item, uh, as uh, members in, uh, of this committee and members of the public will uh, note, has been an uh, intensely iterative process and uh, one that's been community-driven over a number of months uh, and throughout this school year, uh, really even reaching out back before the start of the school year when um, Dr. Caselli has first uh, um, uh, came on the scene and, and arrived in Boston. Um, I want to first thank... Uh, her for her work um, throughout this process and leading it, shepherding us to where we are uh, today with this revised, um, or I shouldn't say revised, but updated strategic plan for the years 2020 to 2025. And also uh, Dr. Charles Granson as well, who's joined us um, for uh, the vote here. Uh, Dr. Granson, as all of you know, is our chief equity and strategy officer and has done uh, truly tireless work um, in leading this uh, collaborative process with uh, stakeholders, both inside and outside uh, the district. So at this time, I'd like to invite uh, the superintendent to offer any further comments, uh, as well as uh, Dr. Granson, and then uh, we can move on to any uh, final questions or comments from the committee before uh, moving to a vote. So thank you, Mr. Chair, that is uh, really a great day to be able to bring this final plan to you. <clears throat> it has been um, a work in progress for many, many, many months, and it is the community's plan. I think you will see reflected in the strategic plan all of the voices and all of the themes that we um, saw in all of the engagement activities. There's teacher voice in this, there's uh, a family voice, there's partnerships um, had a play in this, in, in our commitments. And we really lifted up um, what they wanted to see as priorities within the district. I'm most proud of <clears throat> the fact that we focus, like uh, Mr. Mudd said, on closing of opportunity and achievement gaps in this plan, and that we focus on accelerating learning and cultivating trust within the community. And I think that's huge. And then our commitment to amplifying voice. I'm just so excited about um, the commitments that are in here, they're just genuine. And I think they're genuine because they reflect what the community has said that they want as their priorities. <clears throat> so 
I can't thank uh, Dr. Granson enough, and I know Ava Mitchell, who has been supporting him in a consultant role quite a bit, as well as Monica Roberts um, and her entire team who helped with the 100-day tour and all of the town halls and parent council engagement. Um, there's just so many people to name uh, who were part of the creation of this plan, including all of you for the hearings and the many times that you uh, read it and gave us revisions and such thoughtful um, feedback. So I'm very proud of this plan. I think it is going to launch us into a new era and we actually added a page on COVID in the plan. So as you read through it, you will see there's a page in COVID and we have a commitment under every single one of our six commitments, um, which is a new thing that we added because we believe that even as this plan is in glossy and beautiful as we give it to you, it is a living plan and it will be continued to be revisited. Um, so with that, I'll give it over to um, Dr. Granson. Thanks, Dr. Casalius, um, and uh, thanks, Chair Lacanto. And I just want to um, just quickly re reiterate um, the great the, the gratitude for um, members of the community who came together to make this plan what it is. Um, and we look forward to uh, moving ahead um, and doing the the hardest part of the work, which is, um, as Superintendent Casalius said, um, you know, keeping it uh, a living document. Uh, so thanks, everyone. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Granson, and thank you again for uh, that um, summation, uh, Dr. Caselius. I want to go around and see if there are uh, final questions or comments from uh, the committee. Dr. Coleman? Yes, this truly was a tour de force, and it's, and it, and it, it, it's very well done. And most importantly, um, you know, although we were looking, I think at one point for a more of a uh, pithier, easier to describe project, um, I think as we grapple, as you grappled with the self choice, you've created a comprehensive uh, plan and program, which I think at the at the end of the day is going to serve us uh, much better than than um, just focusing first with the communication. So I appreciate the hard work that was done and, and the clarity, uh, the emphasis, um, and both in, in this piece and then in the, op the Opportunity Act that we'll discuss later. So there are really, so I, you know, I think I'm ready to vote for it. I think it's, it's very good. There are two things though that I wanna put on the table that as we go forward, I, I want us to kind of be uh, clear about. And the one is, you know, I appreciate the, the, the types of data that are being addressed in each one of the um, um, uh, commitments. Um, but what I would, um, what I'm going to want to find out and know, you know, fairly shortly, is are we? How are we going to really use that data? Are we going to be identifying progress? So we're going to increase by X percent each year. So it's going to be a progress metric measure on each of those, or is it an outcome? Here is the bar that we're seeking to cross. So we know we'll good, we'll good when we get here. And I think, in a, um, I, I think either could work, but I would want us to be articulate about that. So that, that's one, one area that as we go forward in the work I, I want to address. And the other, and, and I don't think it's here, um, as you've heard me, as everyone's heard me say before, I'm one of the people who believes that it's the teacher in the classroom at the end of the day, that counts when you know, when you hold everything equal. It's that educator with our children who makes the biggest difference, and there's a lot of national, international data to support that. And um, we need to organize to that moment. So, what's not in the conversation to date is a real explicit measure of teacher effectiveness. Completely support increasing the diversity, and that. so everything we have there is very useful. But at one point, we have to know what. Um, competent teaching looks like, it acts like, and feels like. I think we need to be able to measure that, assess that, uh, in, in the worst sense of the word, grade it. And I think we at aggregate, I have no interest in individual teachers grades, but in aggregate, see where we are. And we, I, I would encourage us to make that explicit, explicit as we go forward. Again, thank you for the huge amount of work and the community engagement and the sense that this is something we all own and that we're all responsible for. I think you all have done a magnificent job of getting us there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Coleman. And um, 
I wanted to just uh, pause for a moment to see if there was further uh, response from uh, the superintendent or Dr. Granson. Um, I would just mention, Dr. Coleman, that I think we'll be doing both leading and late uh, lagging indicators. I think that we have the opportunity now with COVID and all of the remote learning and all the data dashboards that we're doing to have, I think, what's going to become a much more um, useful measure and dashboards that we use uh, regularly. And I think that they will be dynamic and uh, static measures for us to gauge our progress and set targets. And then uh, also have out there really what are our ambitious stretch goals that we'll be doing. I do want to mention, and I know that Mr. Mudd talked about it in his comments that, you know, our operational plan that we presented was really an overview for you to see what kinds of activities we'll be working on, but we will have deeper level plans at each of the departmental levels, as well as the quality school improvement plans. And those will all be based in equity. And we've had our, our um, school leaders start a new process around equity roundtables at their schools. Um, and so not only do we have a district equity roundtable, we also have a, a new expectation for our schools around equity roundtable. And then we've also revised our equity toolkit and requiring um, our departments and our schools to use the equity toolkit. And I don't know if Dr. Granson wants to speak to the process that we will be using to really deploy the strategic plan through the entire organization. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and so we launch uh, right after, um, you know, if there's a successful vote tonight, um, we launch right into uh, bringing together um, all members across uh, central office to put together a department to work plans as the, as the superintendent mentioned. Um, and that process is going to be a rigorous process that really starts with um, looking at what are the things that aren't aligned with the strategic plan that we need to stop doing um, and making sure that we're all clear and on the same page about um, how we move forward in a way that's um, about coherence and alignment um, to this plan. There really is a reflection of the values of the community um, and a number of different stakeholders. Um, and, and from there, as we build those um, work plans, um, the, the great thing about uh, what the superintendent has done in merging our equity work with our strategy work is we'll then be uh, partnering with the Opportunity Gaps Office um, to make sure that those goals that are um, that come from our Opportunity Achievement Gaps um, uh, policy uh, are aligned with the work that we're doing um, and with departmental work plans. So that work will start to come together um, and roll out uh, into the summer so that we can provide schools um, with support around their school um, uh, quality school plans and so that we're trying to we can see the through line directly from the strategic plan to the district operational plan to departmental work plans um, and then quality school plans and we are ambitious to hope we hope to get uh, that down even to um, you know the individualized learning plans that students will have um, and so um, we're striving for coherence and alignment um, in, in implementation. Thank you again. Uh, oh, Dr. Coleman, you look like you. Thank you. The, the, uh, very exciting work and, and, and groundbreaking and, and leading leading the nation in, in, in this type of conversation to have it so well integrated. And so uh, I don't want anything to suggest that I'm not uh, um, enthusiastic about the progress that, that we're making as a community. And I just want to do want to put one more point on the table that uh, I think that as we go forward, a uh, conversation that is growing and is implicit in a lot of the things we're doing is this issue of what autonomy, autonomy now means in Boston. And I just, I, I don't want to, I don't want to um, drift into a new approach. It's a one point, not, not this semester, not this school year, but certainly as the next year's school year starts to really have some explicit conversations about how Boston thinks about autonomy and what we were gaining with increased uh, coherence and, and, and commonality across schools and as opposed to a historical perspective that said that it was the autonomous schools that were doing the best for our children. So I would argue that we need to bring that explicit going forward and not drift um, from that because I think there are, there's a lot of uh, perspectives around the community that uh, I think we want to bring in alignment uh, for so we can maintain a coherent approach. But thank um, you again for your. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Coleman. I do want to remind members that, you know, we did have the DESI review 
who really called out some of the autonomies and the need for the work around autonomous schools, given they are a large proportion of our transformation schools. And so um, this is an issue on our DESE MOU uh, for one of the things that we need to negotiate over the next 60 days is how we are going to uh, develop a new model for earned, earned autonomy is how it's stated. Yeah, I think that the conversation of earned autonomy is something that we've, the 12 years I've been around the district has been a conversation. We've been looking for coherence around that, but I don't wanna, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure I agree with everything in the DESI report. So did that is, I think there's some issues in the way they constructed and use their data that I think is another conversation for to have. And on the other hand, there's been large reports that have been accepted within the community that's autonomy that were the drivers of success. And I just think, you know, I understand the, I understand the pressures and I understand where autonomy hasn't worked for a lot of communities, but I, we need to come to that uh, as a group uh, explicitly and make sure we're all on, this, all on the same page because I'm not sure as a community we, we are. I would also like to note, Dr. Coleman, that um, in the strategic plan, there are a number of places where we talk about the opportunity achievement gap, but we measure it with MCAS. And so without the administration of MCAS this year, we will have to determine how we measure that in the future, but we didn't change it here because it's a five-year plan and we uh, fully expect that we will be able to measure it at some point in the future. Members, I wanna interject uh, for a moment. Um, I think this is a great conversation and um, one that I think we'll continue to have over a great uh, many months and years to come uh, as we continue to implement the strategic plan and um, the superintendent operationalizes that on many levels, but I do want to remind folks that we will have many other opportunities to have these conversations as well. Uh, this mm -hmm. is um, an opportunity for us just to make a few final comments um, before we, uh, we take a vote. So with that in mind, I will um, go next to Dr. Uh, Rivera, and then it looks like uh, Ms., uh, Mr. O'Neill, uh, and then Vice Chair Oliver Davila. Um, so again, thanks to everyone for all the hard work on the plan. And also, I just have to say, I really love the way the publication looks. There's so some wonderful photographs in there. And so the design people, I'll give a shout out to them as well. Um, I, I just, again, I know I've, I've, you've heard me say this many times as well as being the co-chair of the English Learners Task Force that... Um, we really um, would love to, again, see more initiatives um, rolling out with the kind of, um, you know, flexibility we now have under the LOOK Act and to really, you know, center our English learners. I think that was a phrase used by one of our um, testimonials earlier um, of how, you know, we keep that, um, centered that English learners are, are really, you know, um, becoming a majority in our district. And so what can we uh, do specifically around also native language uh, literacy um, and moving just, you know, we still need SEI programs, but, you know, there's, there's a lot of opportunities around dual language and, and what other school districts in Massachusetts um, have been able to, to roll out since 2017. So I, I hope that that's something that um, we can really um, fast forward um, as, as we, you know, I know we're struggling with all these other issues right now, um, but again, that, you know, we keep our most vulnerable um, students said mind, English learners and especially English learners with disabilities and how do we, you know, innovate um, with, with the kinds of things that we could potentially do under the LOOK Act. So thank you again. Agreed. And I just want to really um, share that, you know, this is a huge value of ours, obviously, in the district. Um, our EL learners, um, with over 50% of our students speaking multiple languages, it's very important. Um, and our commitment to making sure that we do get the uh, LOOK Act in um, our bilingual plan in. So I know that Dr. De Los Reyes is working with Andrea Zayas on this, um, on this plan as one of their top priorities. Thank you, Superintendent. Mr. O'Neill. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I know we're at the end of a long journey here uh, that is now starting a, a much more important journey. So superintendent uh, to you and to Dr. Granson and to your entire team that has worked on this, my heartfelt congratulations, <clears throat> both for the outcome of it, but also the process that you went through to get here. So those community group meetings were incredibly important. I still, my visual from this uh, strategic plan is going to be those boards that you did or that you had done, uh, that we all walked around and read, but they were, uh, they informed your work. They, they proved to the community that you were actually listening um, and that you heard and that you acted because of it. And that was an important message for our community here when you came to the city. So uh, thank you for that. I, I, um, I'm appreciative of, of the six things that you are focused in on. I recognize the work that goes on from here with an implementation plan all the way down the various levels that Dr. Granson just said. I have one piece of feedback on it. It is not gonna stop me at all from supporting this wholeheartedly. Um, I only bring it up because I think it is important and it's something I've mentioned several times and that is I think what we are measuring has to reflect as accurately as possible what the actual um, goals are in each of the six categories. I'm not necessarily sure that what we are measuring, for example, around uh, teacher issues exactly align with what you are laying out as goals. And another example that, that jumps at me, and I thank you for putting in about customer service. I know I have harped about that. I think it is very important. I've seen in cities like Austin and others where when they verbalize customer service is important, that's something parents can get used to. They can understand. They may not understand synchronicity, synchronicity like we talked about earlier tonight, but they understand a customer service mentality. And I'm not quite sure measuring a, a culture survey inside the bowling building truly measures customer service. But th those are two minor points. Um, I recognize that we had a conversation about this a couple weeks ago, and I was digging in on some of the points about the implementation plan. As you reminded us, that is kind of your work. The strategic plan is the school committee's work. And so I'm making my comments about the strategic plan. But quite frankly, the solution for me is to not nitpick about this because I think we're at a point of let's get it done, let's move forward. It's, and I'm very supportive of the overall work. I do plan upon revisiting this when we have a committee conversation about your goals as we evaluate you as superintendent. At some point we have to do it, right? And so, um, you know, school committees are designed to approve policy. Um, hire a superintendent to implement the policy, uh, approve a budget that allows you to reach that and then evaluate. And it would make sense for us to have the key evaluation goals be aligned with these six items on the strategic plan. And at that point, I think it's appropriate for us to have a conversation about what is it that we are measuring to truly reflect progress on the six goals that we collectively the superintendent and the school committee have aligned with under the strategic plan. Um, so well, I just want to make I wanted to make that comment, um, and but in no way diminishing the enormous respect for I have for both the process you went through and the outcome you came up with. And I commit to really revisiting the measures. I think I was um, saying that with Dr. Coleman as well. So we can certainly come back to the measures at a later date when we know um, more firmly what the measures are. Now, now that I do believe we will actually be able to, now that we're connected to all of our families, yep. be able to do a lot more uh, surveying of our families on um, their, their impressions of our service to them. That's great. Yeah, I, I'm such a firm believer and I've had a lot of experiences in my corporate life of you inspect what you expect. And so I just want to make sure that we're really firmly aligned in what we're measuring, that it's truly um, showing progress towards the goals that we want. But minor point, again, tremendous congratulations, both on the process you followed and the outcome that you have in front of us tonight. And I'm very supportive. 
Thank you, Mr. O'Neill. And just a further point on feedback on the operational plan. I've heard uh, in recent days, uh, as, as has the vice chair, from uh, co-chairs in the EOL and OAG task forces about um, their desire to provide further um, feedback. And, you know, much as development of the strategic plan was an iterative process, so will the, the uh, oper oper operationalization, that's a $5 word, um, of the plan. Um, Still easier yeah. than synchronization. Yeah. <laughs> Asynchronous is something you have to practice, of course. Um, but um, we'll, we'll look forward to uh, that continued work uh, with uh, our task forces who we greatly value in uh, providing that um, pinpoint uh, input on um, some of our most vulnerable groups. Ms. Robinson, you had a quick comment, then we're on to questions. Yes, I, I just want to echo what my fellow members have said, and just to say thank you to everyone that has worked so hard on this. It was a different world when this project got started. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, you know, going through all of the meetings, et cetera, and everybody's input certainly made it a strong plan, but COVID has given us a new world. And so I'm hoping also as we move forward that we will take the lessons learned to be able to incorporate into the work as it moves forward, because I believe it's going to both enhance and change many of the things in the actions in the way that they can go forward. But I feel this plan is so strong, it gives us a wonderful roadmap. So we just have to get on that road and keep going, but thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Robinson. Vice Chair Albert Davila. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I do want to echo um, everybody's comments on all the work. Um, I was able to go to a, a few of the community gatherings. I know it was a lot of work um, for the superintendent and for all the staff and, uh, and, and Dr. Granson and everyone. And uh, I don't think we should take lightly that you have been doing all this work as well as all the emergency work that's happening. So all of the team, I think that's really extraordinary um, and I just want to say thank you um, and hopefully you know everybody realizes the amount of work that's been happening um, that we're still moving forward at, even though we are we're doing some you know emergency stuff and um, that's really important to say my comments are um, that I really appreciated seeing point number six around activating partnerships um, I know that I talked about it early on so being able to see it um, is great. Um, and I think especially now when you look at like um, partnerships that have to do with some of the uh, community organizations, the out of school time providers, never has that been more important than now as we look at what the summer will look like. Um, many of us have been running uh, summer uh, learning programs um, as part of the fifth quarter and so um, being able to continue that work is never more important than now, um, considering, you know, so many, so many of our young people, you know, because of, you know, things that can't be helped um, in this pandemic, um, we need to make sure that we have um, young, that people have, young people have the opportunity to catch up. Um, so I, I really appreciate seeing the Activate um, partnerships. Um, I, I would just say two comments and they're going to come up later, but I'm just going to say them. I mean, I do support the plan. I just want to say the two things that I that I um, want to spend a little more time uh, talking about, and it doesn't have to be right at this moment because, as uh, the chair mentioned, you know, we'll be talking about the operational part. But I do want to say um, that the piece around uh, redes uh, redesigning secondary schools. Um, and the alignment with Mass Corps. So I've said this before, I'll say it again, um, that I do think that has to be a much more in-depth conversation. There can be many intended consequences around that. Um, and it also requires a conversation around budget. For those schools that do not have all the pieces to have Mass Corps, we need to make sure that they actually have that a budget to do so. I think the other pieces, you know, we have to, understand what does it mean to say we're going to have mass core on our graduation rates and we want we want to have high expectations i absolutely agree with that and at the same time i wonder how much flexibility we have if a student is left behind in something um 
does a headmaster, for example, have the authority to say, you know, instead of taking a pottery class, you know, they need to actually take a literacy class because they're not going to pass. Um, and I think also, you know, schools will have to make tough choices around, you know, what, um, like now is a perfect example. Our students are having so many issues around mental health. And so uh, if they have to choose between having a social worker or having somebody who's going to deliver, you know, an art class, like, so we, I think, again, we have to be really uh, careful about uh, that looking at that um, and you know I think the other thing that I that I want to talk about later is like the the 7 to 12 piece and what does that mean and who's doing the 7 to 12 um, and lastly just you know the mention of alternative ed alternative ed is a huge uh, and imp not huge it's a it's a very important piece of our portfolio and so I want to be very sensitive to, it's mentioned in there, I don't know, you know, we're not going deep right now, this is just uh, an overall high level look, um, but I, I would want to have more conversations. Again, uh, I want to make sure, you know, there, that we look at, um, that we have deep discussions because there, again, can be many unintended consequences. So, but, you know, other, I, other than that, I'm just going to leave it at that because I, I know we'll have opportunities later, uh, but those are things that stuck out to me and I um, ditto what uh, Dr. Rivera talked about also like the look at piece of the ELL pieces. I do want to see those uh, much more strengthened. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vice Chair. Uh, sounds like we've uh, made our way around the table. Uh, if there's nothing further, I'll entertain a motion to approve the superintendent's 2020 to 2025 strategic plan as presented. So moved. Thank you, uh, Dr. Coleman, second. is there a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Uh, is there any discussion or objection to the motion? Hearing none, Ms. Sullivan, will you please call the roll? Dr. Coleman? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Dr. Rivera? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Tran? Yes. Ms. Oliver Davila? Yes. Mr. Lacanto? Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much, Ms. Sullivan. Uh, folks can hang tight with us. We only have three more votes to go before we return to our, uh, our last report. Uh, our next action item is the District Student Opportunity Act plan. And you will recall that uh, the superintendent presented an overview of this, uh, the district's uh, uh, Student Opportunity Act plan as part of her strategic alignment presentation uh, to the committee on April 15th, our last school committee meeting. I want to thank in particular Chief Accountability Officer Corey Harris for her taking the lead on this process. And for folks that um, uh, need a quick refresher, the Student Opportunity Act plan is something that is required uh, by the state um, as a condition of receiving Student Opportunity Act funds uh, from the, uh, the state um, following uh, the, um, the legislature's passage of uh, the revisions to Chapter funding, uh, excuse me, Chapter 70 funding uh, processes last year um, and uh, the subsequent implementation uh, by the governor. So at this time, I'd like to uh, take a moment uh, and ask the superintendent um, for any final comments uh, from her and from her staff, and then we will uh, move on to questions or comments from the committee. Superintendent, you're on mute. I'm sorry, my computer died, so I had to go and quickly put this up back on my phone. So um, we were at the end of um, Ms. Oliver Davila's uh, comments. It did, what did I miss? I'm sorry. It, are you taking the vote now on the strategic uh, plan? I'm sorry, I, I didn't know that you dropped off. We, uh, we have um, taken the vote on the strategic plan. It passed. Um, I wonder why I didn't hear a reaction. Um, but, uh, You're probably like, where's the superintendent? But my <laughs> computer completely died. And then I was like, plugged it in and tried to put it back up on and it wouldn't go back on. So then I was like, okay, now I got to get on my phone. So Very good. anyways, thank All you everybody back. for, uh, for this, uh, your incredible hard work on the strategic plan. I just very much 
appreciate your um, support of me and of the team uh, to, to deliver on that and, and the entire community. I, I think it will make everybody proud in the long run, so. Well, thank you once again, uh, uh, Dr. Caselius, and uh, to Dr. Granson as well for your work. I, uh, in my haste to move through our, uh, our, our votes, I uh, um, neglected to pause and say thank you uh, once again. Um, so moving on to the business that's at, that's at hand, um, we're on to um, the uh, Student Opportunity Act plan uh, that you presented on at the last meeting, Superintendent. And um, I gave a quick overview of why uh, that uh, plan is required by uh, state law and um, how it fit into your strategic alignment plan um, presentation that you provided at our last meeting and which incorporated the Student Opportunity Act plan the strategic plan, the operational plan that follows the strategic plan, um, and uh, some of the work that uh, went into uh, informing how the district approached that uh, memorandum of understanding with uh, DESE uh, following yep. the DESE review. So yep. um, I, there, there may, uh, I'm not certain that there's anything further that you want to add at this time on the Student Opportunity Act plan before we open it up to brief questions and comments from uh, the committee prior to a vote. No, I, I think it was pretty self-explanatory, um, you know, in the alignment, it's a very, very small amount of money. I mean, it's mm -hmm. probably 1.8 million is a lot of money, but um, in the scheme of a $1.3 billion budget, um, mm -hmm. it's small. So we really did try to identify the activities that we thought were going to help us, um, you know, move forward in, al in, in alignment with the strategic plan and what DESE was expecting in the MOU. Very good. Members, are there further questions or comments? Coleman. Great. Once again, this is a, as you say, it's a very difficult. We're under a lot of pressure. You know, um, I just want to make some comment. I, I think that I'm very comfortable with everything. I wouldn't take anything out. Uh, I think it's well focused in many ways. Um, you know, I'm, I think I'm on record by saying I don't completely agree with all the uh, uh, fundamental prep premises that DES is using to. Uh, uh, make their their recommendations and requests, but I think I think I just want to make sure that's on the table and remembered. But I think there are a couple of things I want to um, uh, think I I would like to have added, not necessarily right away, but that I think there's an absence. One, the focus on AP and and um, I, IB are great if our primary focus is for getting kids into selective high, selective schools. If everyone is moving towards getting into a traditional four-year college-oriented um, uh, liberal arts college, AP, IB are critical for that. And so what, but what I see is an absence of alternatives, particularly I wish we had some, I, I, I want us as, to also equally articulate where we're going with CTE, our career technical education, and the work we're doing about uh, Madison Park and the ways across the various uh, districts around the uh, 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 um, committee, um, excuse me, uh, schools around the district where I think uh, if we're really going to close the achievement gap, are really going to address the needs of uh, our students going forward to have a uh, focus around that first generation into employment, into ownership, and uh, I think we need to uh, reinvigorate that focus. So I don't know if anyone's been recent, uh, there's a new uh, biography out about William Trotter, who really captures this balance between this kind of uh, 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 college orientation and the kind of the more um, frontline work and uh, where he really says is we have to do both. And I think, I think we have to reorient towards what is CTE and I think we need to put some resources and thinking about that that's very important. So that's one thing that I'm gonna vote for this, I'm gonna support this, but as we go forward, I want I want to put that on the table. The second piece is uh, as we as we go through the explicit plan, the real internet the national challenge is you really thinking about in our professional development, we you talked appropriately about the need for more professional development but kind of be an explicit plan, again, going back to how will we know when it's working? Because professional development is an international challenge, as we all know, and, and, and finding ways to be uh, clear about that is very important. I wanna go back, I'm gonna repeat about, you know, there's, are there process variables? 
or outcome variables. We, I think we need to articulate that in one way or the other. And then the other one, the uh, commitment number four under partnerships, uh, I think we need more information there, more, more explicit. I think some of them, you got a good sense of the commitment that the district had made in the other commitments, but that was, I, would, I, would, I, I found that a little bit thin. Um, and not and and understandably that it's a very complex conversation, but uh, as we've said before, these partnerships are central to our progress, and so uh, making that more explicit. Not tomorrow, not next week, not next month, but these are things that as we go forward, particularly as we think about uh, our next year, uh, uh, this more explicit statements about how what are our pro, what are our professional development how we know it's going to be working well and what are we want partnerships to be what are our expectations and how will we know we're, we're getting what we want to have but again it's very good work i know you're working and on the very fact that you're able to give such a high quality uh response to desi in the middle of this crisis is remarkable and we appreciate it and many people even though the person spoke earlier about maybe we want to suspend for a year i, I wouldn't hate that but the fact you move forward in a very articulate wonderful way i commend you and these are just areas i think that will strengthen us as going forward great i, I just want to clarify because i had um had a uh, my computer died, whether we were talking about the MOU or the SOA, the oh. Student Opportunity Act. This is I, the Opportunity Act that was- Yeah, yeah, yeah. so yeah. That's, Sorry, that's, that's, that's okay. That's um, a little different than the MOU, which we did align to the strategic plan as well. So, um, but yeah, and that's just the accounting of that $1.8 million and how we're going to use it um, in the future. Uh, and and um, I was just saying that it was going to be aligned, but your comments about the DESI MOU um, are good ones, and I just I just want to uh, remind folks that DESI does hold us accountable for advanced coursework work in the determinations that they give, and so uh, we do need to increase the advanced coursework. We have 12 high schools that don't even offer any uh, advanced placement courses, so um, doing a small investment in making sure teachers have the professional development for that is really important and the way we would measure that is do students outcomes um, in participating in advanced coursework actually improve do they score a, a three or four you know on their um, advanced placement tests and um, do they actually earn college credit and are they learning uh, in in those measures so I think that that's really important I do also uh, look forward to giving the high school redesign presentation and having Dr. Brueggemann and Dr. McIntyre presenting on the core four which is our first start in seven high schools to really look at improving the level of rigor in those high schools and redesigning those high schools and I think that will address a lot of what you're talking about with the career pathways I think you're going to see we're going to be adding additional support at the district office for middle school career pathway work that we want to do to build up so that we can improve the pathway uh, for our Madison Par uh, Park students. And so I think you're going to see that become very uh, evident in the next uh, several weeks and in, in decisions that we're making and in the presentation around high school redesign. So I look forward to asking, uh, answering those questions as finally, um, when it comes to professional development, teachers are evaluated um, and um, we do evaluations of our professional development as well um, and so we next year in the budget are investing in instructional facilitators in our 33 transformational schools if this model is one that is very valuable because that's a job embedded coaching model um, our academic office is also going to be job embedded a coaching model and we will be able to use um, uh, a process for um, our evaluation of teachers through those those coaching models so i just want you to know we we are addressing those and you'll hear more about them as we operationalize the strategic plan great thank you thank you um uh, dr rivera you have a question um yes um i <clears throat> I know that we had, I had mentioned this before as well, um, in terms of um, the growing our own teachers. And I, I do appreciate uh, seeing that we want to, you know, increase our teacher diversity. But I noticed it was only mentioned um, historically black colleges and universities. And that kind of 
was like, what? I mean, we are sitting here with the Latino Latinx student population being the largest and Latinx communities in the region being the largest uh, minority group as well as uh, predictions that um, um, college, future college enrollments nationally, uh, Latinx students will be the number one um, growing uh, population. So I just, I will, I will vote yes, but I want to see again us really thinking more um, complexly uh, about diversity. It's not, it can't just be also race. It also has to be linguistic diversity as well. And so how do we really elevate the actual needs in our district in terms of representation where it's multilingual, it's Latinx and Asian uh, teachers that we, we really also need. We need black teachers too. But in terms of representation, um, we actually have historically uh, Hispanic serving institutions in our backyard. We at UMass Boston, for example, are minority serving and an Anapesi, Asian American, Pacific Islander, native, you know, native and Pacific Islander serving institutions. So yeah, I want to just, you know, throw that out there that um, what we should really be, if we're growing our own in the region, we need to really be tapping into our local Hispanic serving institutions and Anapesi institutions. So if, if we could add that in there or let's make that a, at least a goal moving forward, um, because I do think, you know, multilingual diversity is, is really what's going to be needed in the future. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Rivera. I just want to assure you that this is top of mind, not only because we are obligated uh, through the Garrity Order to have this be a top priority for us, but it is also a really big part of the strategic direction, and it's a big part of what we heard in the community. So um, that is that is uh, part of it. But for this SOA, it's such a small amount of money. Um, <laughs> you know, that this is really just telling the state, it's an accountability exercise to tell the state what we are doing with some of these resources, but there's a lot more effort that's going to be coming uh, with the additional $100 million uh, that the mayor invested, as well as there's some additional money that is going to be um, available with the, the DESI MOU. So um, not only is it in the strategic plan, it's in the SOA plan, and it's in the DESI MOU that we are going to be focusing on teacher diversity. And absolutely, that means our Latinx teachers. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Superintendent. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rivera. Vice Chair. Oh, OK, I was going to say, Vice Chair, would you like to say something? <laughs> <laughs> thank you for ably taking over for a moment. Yeah, it's yeah. fine. You were missed. Um, thank you, Chair. <laughs> um, so I, I know you dropped off. Um, your computer died in my last comment, so I'm going to reiterate them because they tie to this as well, uh, which is my concern around the mass core piece, which I think, um, I believe we're going to have a deeper presentation at some point, and I feel like we really need to understand what we are going to do. Um, it's, uh, I did hear those, Alex, just so you, you know. Okay. I, yeah, okay. and not that you can't repeat them again, but I did hear that you had concerns around the alternative schools and just how much flexibility there would be in the Mass Corps and just a little bit of concern around that. Yeah, the concern, yeah. definitely the unintended consequences, the budget for it, um, you know, what does it mean for some students? Are we not going to graduate some students if they don't have art? Not everybody has a gym, so we need to have conversations. Um, I know you were not here when um, when previous headmasters came together and had a report on this, and they did not recommend it. But I really want to understand, um, you know, what we are walking into. I think just um, the other piece, and I I I know um, people have gone off the bend to talk about the Desi MOU and all that, so I'm going to do the same. Um, and just say that I am concerned. Um, I, 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 I voted for the seven to 12 piece um, and I still stand behind that. I guess my concern is looking at some of the seven to 12 schools 
that are already struggling um, and just ha adding more to them, um, to some of those uh, high schools, adding that, adding you know AP, adding IB, adding Mass Core. I'm just very worried. And so again, um, I think as we move into these conversations, we all need to understand what does that mean and what we're asking schools to do. Because if you're already a school that's struggling to, and adding all these other pieces, it just makes me very worried. So. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I was on mute. Thank you, Vice Chair. And um, thank you, uh, Superintendent, for uh, going back and um, uh, retrieving the, uh, the comments that the Vice Chair made on the last, um, uh, on the last uh, vote. Excuse me. Um, so if there's no further uh, questions or comments from the membership, um, I will entertain a motion to approve the BPS Student Opportunity Act plan as presented. Is there a motion? I move. Thank you, Mr. O'Neill. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Any discussion or objection to the motion? Uh, Ms. Sullivan, will you please call the roll? Dr. Coleman? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Dr. Rivera? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Tran? Yes. Ms. Oliver Davila? Yes. Mr. Lepanto? Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Uh, well, thank you uh, once again, Ms. Sullivan. Thank you, uh, Superintendent, for um, talking through a little bit more of the nuances around the Student Opportunity Act plan and, and members for your questions and comments here. Um, as has been a common thread throughout all of this conversation tonight, I think we'll be returning to these items quite a bit um, in coming months and years uh, as we continue to measure um, and evaluate how uh, different uh, efforts within um, the strategic plan and all the other operations that, that flow from that are, um, are impacting uh, learning within the district. Uh, so um, we'll look forward to continuing to uh, discuss these issues as we move forward. Um, okay, two votes to go. Uh, next action item is a memorandum of understanding between the Boston School Committee and the Boston Teachers Union on Remote Learning as presented to us early this evening by Mr. Hassan as well as uh, the um, presentation um, and discussion that uh, the committee had uh, in a kind of session earlier this week. Um, we did uh, uh, discuss this um, quite a bit uh, earlier this evening as well as yesterday, but um, I do want to pause for just any final questions or comments from the committee on this MOU. Looking around, it looks like there's uh, no further questions or comments. Uh, and if that's the case, I will entertain a motion to approve the Memorandum of Understanding on Remote Learning between the Boston School Committee and the Boston Teachers Union as presented. Thank you, Mr. O'Neill. Sounds like a second from Dr. Coleman. Uh, Ms. Robinson, uh, is there a, um, any discussion, excuse me, or objection to the motion? Uh, Ms. Sullivan, will you please call the roll? Dr. Coleman? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Dr. Rivera? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Tran? Yes. Ms. Oliver Davila? Ms. Oliver Davila? She's on mute. She may, she may have stepped away for a moment. Okay. Mr. Lacanto? Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Uh, thank you, Ms. Sullivan. Um, and I, I do want to just take a moment once again to thank the superintendent and uh, her team, as well as the teachers union um, in uh, reaching this agreement with us, as we um, have discussed on, on a number of occasions uh, in, in, re in reference to the MOU. Um, we're uh, deeply appreciative of uh, where this puts us at the front of the pack, both in, within the Commonwealth as well as uh, nationwide with respect to obligating our teachers to um, synchronous learning um, student facing learning and um, ensuring that um, we have our teachers ready to uh, to do the work uh, until the job gets done uh, as we continue to implement uh, remote learning within the district. Uh, so thank you once again to, to everyone for their efforts in that regard. 
Uh, all right, our final action item this evening is a resolution in support of increased federal support and stimulus funding for uh, public K-12 education, which Mr. O'Neill presented earlier this evening. Given the time sensitive nature of this issue and with the next school committee meeting not being held until May 13th, uh, I thought it was important that the committee take action uh, on this uh, matter this evening, the same um, uh, evening as the presentation. And as folks note, that's typically not our practice, but in such an urgent matter and, and trying in an effort to uh, call attention to our delegation to this urgent matter as quickly as possible, um, it's, um, this is a prudent measure. Uh, so thank you once again to Mr. O'Neill for his work in um, uh, shepherding this uh, process forward with uh, the Council of Great City Schools. And thank you to uh, the timely input from our uh, Intergovernmental Affairs Office uh, and our Finance Office to uh, add information pertinent to uh, Boston Public Schools. Our IGR uh, colleagues will be uh, taking this to our delegation um, uh, in the morning. Uh, presuming that we vote in favor of the uh, the resolution that's now before us. So, if there any um, are there any final questions or comments from the committee on this resolution before we we ask for a motion? We're just looking around. Uh, it looks like we uh, had um, full conversation. Oh, Mr. O'Neill. Yeah, like Mr. Chair, I just want to point out it's also been and pointed out to me this evening that. It may be interesting as well for the council to also approach some of the national organizations that work with many of our districts. They also have uh, national leadership that is tied in at the Hill. They have um, boards of directors that can be influential, et cetera. So city, uh, citizen schools, you name a bunch of the national organizations that uh, deal with a, a large number of these districts may be interested in joining on as well. Thank you very much uh, for noting that, uh, Mr. O'Neill. I know um, City Year has been active in this space, and um, they uh, they do work closely with uh, the AmeriCorps uh, program that funds uh, many of their members. And uh, you know, certainly that organization, as well as a number of the others that you uh, you mentioned, have um, uh, folks with deep uh, experience and, and connections within uh, the federal government. So um, so that's a timely note, and thank you for that. Uh, if there's nothing further, I'll entertain a motion to approve as presented uh, the school committee's resolution in support of increased federal support and stimulus funding for public K-12 education. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Tran. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Any discussion or objections to the motion? Nope. Well, thank you again. Uh, Ms. Sullivan, will you please call the roll? Dr. Coleman? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Dr. Rivera? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Tran? Yes. Ms. Oliver Davila? Yes. Mr. Lacanto? Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much, Ms. Sullivan, and thank you once again to my fellow members for uh, taking up this urgent measure, uh, measure uh, so quickly. Um, I really appreciate um, the um, uh, comradeship that uh, we're uh, exhibiting tonight with our, our colleagues all across the country in uh, working towards uh, increased federal funding for our schools uh, during this time. Uh, we're all in it together and uh, it's um, through uh, efforts like this that we can demonstrate that to our, uh, our legislators and uh, continue to work together for the common good which is our, our uh, nation's students. <laughs> Um, so uh, we've made it through the Votorama, so thank you. Uh, pat yourselves on the back. Um, we uh, are going to move on now to our final report this evening, uh, which is uh, a um, request for uh, approval of a private school application for the Croft School. Uh, now, as a reminder to uh, members of the school committee, as well as those following us at home, uh, the Massachusetts general laws require that private schools wishing to open uh, within a city or a town's um, uh, limits must first receive approval from their local school committee. Uh, so in this case, uh, the Croft School uh, is uh, proposed for uh, operation in uh, the Jamaica Plain neighborhood of Boston. And uh, so their uh, proposal is coming to us tonight um, for uh, consideration and uh, a vote at our next school committee meeting. 
Uh, at this time, I'm going to invite our Chief Accountability Officer, Corey Harris, uh, who has joined us on Zoom, as well as uh, Mr. Scott Gibbon, who is the, Scro the Croft School founder, um, to present their report. Mr. Harris, uh, Mr. Gibbon, please proceed. All right. Uh, is the presentation showing? It is, uh, but it's not full uh, full screen. Okay. There you go. Looks great. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Chairperson Lacanto, school committee members, Superintendent Caselius, listening audience, uh, thank you for the, the time this evening. Uh, as Chairperson Lacanto uh, mentioned, I'll be presenting with uh, Scott Gibbon, uh, who is one of the founders. Uh, we received uh, application for the Croft School, and we're here to uh, discuss that with you. Uh, as uh, Chairperson Lacanto mentioned, uh, Mass General Law requires that we evaluate uh, this application. And then in 2011, uh, Boston School Committee uh, set a process by which we would evaluate the application. Uh, that process requires the um, Chief Accountability Officer or a designee, along with a representative from the Office of Academics, um, as well as a school leader uh, with a similar grade structure as the um, applicant uh, participate in the review committee. So that committee has done its due diligence uh, in evaluating the application for the Croft School, and we recommend approval um, to the Boston School Committee. Uh, the key steps in the process uh, were as follows. We received application in early January. Uh, I had a meeting with both of the school founders uh, in early January to better understand uh, their philosophy and, and their approach uh, towards opening the school and making sure they understood uh, the entire process um, of approval. Uh, we put, I put together a review team uh, and a timeline to complete the process in February, uh, convened the central office team in April, and we completed the evaluation process, and we made a recommendation for approval uh, to the superintendent who's uh, appointing me as designee to make that recommendation to school committee. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to um, Mr. Given so that he can give you more specifics on the school. Great. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Harris. Um, thank you, everybody, uh, for hearing our proposal. Um, the Croft School is proposed as a new private school uh, to be located just on the Jamaica Plain Rosendale uh, line uh, near Forest Hills T Station. Uh, the school is named actually after my high school history teacher and track coach, uh, Mr. Hal Croft. Um, the school will be located at um, 3815 Washington Street, um, which is the site of former um, Harvest Grocery Mart, um, which went out of business within the last couple of years. Um, we're, we're right near the end of a, a $2 million renovation project on that building. Um, it, uh, it's about 90% complete, um, and we're on pause uh, until construction uh, can resume in the city. Um, we're intending to open our school with 40 students, um, 20 of those students in a K-1 classroom and 20 students in a K-2 kindergarten classroom. Um, and then the school would add one a grade level each year until we would become a full 160 student um, K-1 through grade six school. Um, we're intending to create a school that is high quality uh, and uh, diverse. We've been really um, thrilled by the level of interest um, from families across the city. Um, and um, we're excited to add um, another option to the many um, high quality options that exist in Boston right now for elementary school. Um, add, as noted on this slide, um, we've filled 95% of our seats, 55% um, of our students identify as students of color. Um, we're very fortunate to have a significant amount of financial aid available um, and 45% of the students qualify for uh, financial support um, up to and including full scholarships uh, and 95% of our students um, reside in the city of Boston um, from JP, from Roslindale, from Hyde Park um, and a few students from Roxbury, Dorchester and West, West Roxbury each. Um, the question has come up whether um, we would uh, 
the, our, whether our students and families would be relying on any Boston Public Schools transportation in our early years. Um, and we've um, sent out a survey to our enrolled um, families um, to ask them, um, and none of our enrolled families at this point are, intend to use Boston Public Schools transportation um, in the 2020-2021 school year. Um, just very basically about the program itself, um, we think of our school model as having five components, um, includes including indoor and outdoor play, um, hands-on project-based learning, um, 10 student enrichment classes, which happen twice daily, um, trips throughout the city of Boston every Friday. Um, and then our core curricula is uh, delivered in a workshop model. Um, and as noted on the slide uh, here, we use a combination of Lucy Hawkins um, and foundations, uh, Wilson Foundations in our English language arts program and a combination of uh, investigations and Singapore math uh, in our um, mathematics program. And if approved, uh, my own two sons um, will be um, two of the, the school students um, when it opens next year. That concludes our presentation and we will um, entertain any questions. Sorry, I muted myself. Uh, thank you, Mr. Given. Uh, thank you, Mr. Harris. Mr. Given, it's nice to see you back. I know uh, we, you're uh, well known to the committee and to uh, the Boston community with your uh, former work with uh, Academy. Um, I uh, want to open up now to uh, the, the committee for questions and discussion. Um, if folks can um, virtually raise their hand or uh, make a note in the, uh, the chat box or um, otherwise just wave at me, uh, I'd be uh, happy to call on you. Looks like um, Ms. Rivera, uh, Dr. Rivera, excuse me, has raised her hand. Let's start with you and then we'll go to Ms. Robinson. Um, and then Mr. Coleman, uh, Dr. Coleman, excuse me, I'm having trouble with my uh, titles tonight. Yeah, um, so no, I live, I live just within walking distance of the proposed new school. Um, my son went to the Sumner School here and there's a very strong um, Rosendale Pathways of our, our small schools here. I'm worried about how this is gonna affect the enrollments um, in some of the Rosendale schools. Like, do we need another school in Rosendale or is this really mostly gonna service Jamaica Plain privileged families. Sorry to put it that way, but um, that's a concern that I have. Sure. I, yeah, I, I appreciate that question very much, um, certainly. And I think, you know, I, my work in the district um, goes back a ways and, and kind of the core commitment of the school um, in opening up has been to create um, a really diverse school um, among our faculty and among our uh, student body as well. Um, we've worked um, exceptionally hard over the last eight to nine months or so um, to ensure that um, we're, we're providing access to families from all over the city um, across different neighborhoods and including to families who may for whatever reasons be interested in a private uh, option, but who, for whom did not think that would be financially feasible um, previously. And, um, you know, we have really, it's just, so there are 20 students in each grade level in our school. Um, and, and, you know, the way that plays out is a handful of students from each neighborhood um, in the school uh, 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 each, each year. If, if I could just Dr. Follow Rivera, up on, you have something to follow up on? Yeah, no, I just, I still want to know how this could potentially, because, you know, we've lost in the district so many of our kids and seats to charter schools. Um, how is this going to affect the enrollments in our BPS schools? That's, that's really what I, I'm really concerned about. Sure. So, so one, you know, one um, data point that I can provide is, so we, you know, I, I have roots in Boston and, and, and Boston is kind of close to my heart, which is why we're excited to open the school in Boston. We, you know, we opened um, a similar school in Providence two years ago, um, same size. Um, 
And what we saw is there about a third of our students who have enrolled there. Um, otherwise, we, we ask families, you know, once they enroll, where would you have enrolled if the Croft School didn't exist? And about a third of our families say um, they would have enrolled in their you know, local public school or another public school or charter school in the district. Um, about a third of those families say they would have tried to find another lower cost private school option, such as a Catholic school um, or Montessori type school. And a third of our families um, say we were, you know, intending to enroll in a kind of more elite high price private school. But when we realized this is a great option at you know, more than half, less than half the price for tuition. This is the school we decided. So I can't kind of, of course, like project right now um, exactly, you know, who our student body will be over time. But I think to, to, to answer your question, that's kind of the data points we have. We also have a lot of families, which we're excited about, who've said, this is a school that, um, you know, really, keeps us in the city for the long term. And that's you know, kind of the many options they were considering as to kind of where to go um, and where to move if they were gonna move. Like the idea of staying put in the city, which is what they've wanted to do and enrolling in a Croft is exciting for them. Dr. Vera, did you have further questions at this time? I, I... I mean, I still, I, I guess we don't know, but I, 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 I think what we could guess is that there are going to be um, some of our Boston public school students that will end up going to this school at some point. Um, and so it, it raises the same concerns I have about the charter school expansion and, um, and I have some strong feelings about that, but you know, just voicing these concerns about equity who will, you know, how will, again, this is a, there's going to be tuition. So it's, there's already going to be uh, equity issues there. Um, so yeah, just, just needed to raise those, those issues. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rivera. Uh, we'll go on now to uh, Ms. Robinson. Yes. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, actually, I drove past today exactly where the school is going to be on my way to another meeting. Um, I had two questions. Following up a little bit on what um, Dr. Rivera was speaking to, but my questions are, um, where does the funding come from the school and, and why a school now? What was the motivation for um, creating the school at this moment in time? Sure. So the second um, question I can answer quite easily, it's because um, I have two young boys. They're three and five and um, kind of my dream um, had been to create a school um, which they could attend. Um, and um, I'm excited that if, you know, if the school is approved, they would be able to do that. So it's very, it's cool, very, very driven by um, kind of for my own family and me, kind of what we um, were excited about in a school. And it seems like that kind of hope and vision has resonated um, with a number of other families um, across the city as well. Um, so that's exciting. Um, in terms of the funding, um, a couple of things. So um, one, I, I, uh, in my kind of prior professional life, led a nonprofit organization um, and was connected to various um, individuals and foundations across the city. Um, and uh, those individuals have been very uh, generous um, in supporting um, our endeavor. Um, and getting the school going, including its scholarship fund. Um, and then um, for my own family as well, um, we've put a, a, a number of our own resources towards the school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And who will the teachers be? Great. So we have hired um, uh, 11 of our 12 uh, teachers right now. Um, and uh, for, for the starting kind of uh, uh, year of the school, um, it is a wonderfully uh, experienced, uh, talented, and diverse group. So our um, more than 50% um, of our teachers uh, will be teachers of color, um, including with different linguistic uh, backgrounds. Um, and then among other staff members, um, 
uh, a similar um, uh, percentage of uh, staff members of color. Um, and they have come from, uh, you know, one has come from a, a preschool in the area, another has come from um, a, a public school just outside of uh, the city of Boston. Another has come from um, a charter school within the city of Boston. So a, a variety of different experiences. Um, our head of school, um, Peter Cipperoni, uh, he is most recently um, an assistant principal um, at a diverse public school in the city of Brooklyn. Okay, thank you. That's mm -hmm. all the questions I have at the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Robinson. We'll move on now to Dr. Coleman. Great, Th thank you. Um, very excited, I appreciate the questions that my colleagues have, have answered and, 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 and I think the future. I was surprised, I didn't, I, I don't know whether I missed other materials, but I didn't get a sense of really what the school curriculum was be. I had some topical headings, but I didn't have any. Was there a more in-depth application about the financing, the faculty, and what the curriculums would look like and act like? Or did that was did that did I miss that? Or did this go through the the internal review and then just a summary was given to us? Yeah, so uh, the, the process is, uh, it goes through this general review process. There's a rubric that we use, and then we bring this uh, information to school committee. Uh, we're more than happy to share all of the materials and rubrics um, that were used in order to get to the recommendation. Yeah, I, 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 it's my memory, and correct me wrong, I mean, I'm sure Neil probably has better memory than I do, that other, like when we had charter schools, et cetera, we get more material about what's really in, what, what we're really approving. And so I think I would appreciate just a little more, you know, more data than I have. But that, so that, that very helps me clarify that I didn't miss something, which is, would be <laughs> something that happens we'll, to me. Too often. We'll share the entire folder. Great, that'd be wonderful. Thank you. Um, and then, and I do think the whole the, we, the, the need to track what will be the impact on the enrollment of the, the schools for whom we're directly responsible as we as we bring other schools into our ecology uh, is an important thing that we need to track. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Coleman. And um, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you, uh, Mr. Harris, for. Um, uh, opining on um, uh, the further uh, materials that are available. Um, I am looking back at um, the, uh, the first slide in your presentation that references our uh, school committee policy dating back to 2011, uh, which lays out the expectations for uh, these reviews. And that includes an application uh, process, a site visit, um, and then a recommendation from uh, the, the superintendent um, about whether to uh, approve uh, the application. Um, so I think in, in addition to sharing with us uh, those materials, including uh, specifically the report of the visit, uh, the site visit committee, um, it would be helpful for us to have that resolution uh, as well um, as a refresher. Um, Mr. Harris, you might have that at, at your fingertips you can provide. And if not, um, I'm sure Ms. Uh, Sullivan can find that for us and distribute it to the committee. Uh, we're on now to uh, Mr. O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you for the presentation tonight. Um, Mr. Gibbon, nice to see you again, uh, as always. Uh, some of the newer the members of the uh, committee may not uh, be as familiar with you, but as the chair noted, you were the former CEO of um, UP, which is a partner with, uh, with the city, uh, with the district, and several of our schools. So we have had, you've had a long relationship with Boston Public Schools. and. Um, not surprised you are creating a new school because you are very entrepreneurial and creative in your endeavors, but you have always done it with the spirit of partnership as well. Um, so I, I do want to point that out to my fellow members. And I understand the concerns being raised because I, I, as my fellow members know, I always think in terms of market share and I hate the potential of, of losing students elsewhere. But Mr. Chair, it may be helpful, again, as part of that refresher that you mentioned of the 2011 policy, um, to have legal counsel also just share with us, because this is a very particular provision of state law that we approve private schools in our district, but I believe we are only approving that the district itself has looked at it with regards to curriculum and that type of thing. We're not allowed to say, no, we don't want that type of school 
you know, we don't want, we're, we have religious schools come before us all the time. We have schools by certain cultures, such as the British school, the, the French school, et cetera. Right. Uh, and so I think we're not allowed to get into, no, we don't want them as competition. We right. can only focus on the district review is all around, are they gonna provide an adequate curriculum for the student that they're gonna be serving? I, I believe that's the framework that we're supposed to be following. And um, yep. Mr. Harris, you may you may have uh, looked at that and therefore how you arrived at the recommendation. But I think finding out some of that background information, both the application and what the findings were from the site visit would help us inform the recommendation that you were making. And then Mr. Chair, if we could just get some clarification on what we are supposed to be looking at and, and what we're not. Because like, my fellow members, I, I get concerned about equity. I get concerned about transportation. I get concerned about, are, are we, is this gonna be competition? It is not taking dollars from us because ironically, we actually don't approve charter schools in the city that is approved at the state level. Right. Um, so I, it just some some further guidance on that because it's, it's few and far in between when we actually have these come before us. So for us to be clear on what we are supposed to be looking at, what we know it would be helpful. Yes, thank you, Mr. O'Neill. And, and to your point, uh, referring once again to that first slide in um, the presentation this evening, there is uh, the reference um, to uh, the Mass General Laws that um, require local school committees to review and license local schools, quote, when satisfied that the instruction in all, all the studies required by law equals in thoroughness and efficiency and in the progress made therein that the public schools in the same town provide. Um, so that's the standard that we use. And I think um, to your point, it would be helpful uh, when the district does provide us that further background information, if they can sort sort of expound on what the context is for um, that licensing and, and provisioning uh, power of the school committee. Um, I believe we're moving on now to um, Vice Chair Oliver Dabble for further questions and comments. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm curious um, how much your tuition is. Sure. So our tuition um, is about eighteen thousand seven hundred dollars, um, and we kind of come at that two ways. Um, one, you know, we know there's a lot of um, significantly more expensive private schools in Boston and just beyond Boston, and we wanted to, um, at full tuition, make make the school more accessible to more families. But of course, we recognize that there are many families um, you know, uh, that would not be able to access a tuition of, of that level. Um, so um, a, a, there's a significant number of our families, um, nearly a majority, um, who uh, in this op opening year, who, whose tuition is between zero um, and uh, a few thousand dollars. Um, so we've really kind of worked um, to use that scholarship fund that we have um, to um, create that accessibility, that greater accessibility. Um, and in terms of um, the K to six, why did you land on sixth grade? Is it because the space is so small or is there a specific reason why it's not a K to eight and it's a K to six? Yeah, so so part of it was driven by real estate, um, you know, where the we're um, only able to fit so many classrooms in this space. Um, but um, when we talked to uh, a number of our families um, that were interested in the school right from the get go, when we were considering, should this be a K one through eight? Should this be a K one through six? A lot of those families said. Um, we're, you know, we're really, in, many have kind of uh, very interested in Boston public schools, um, exam schools, um, and, and or other options that begin at grade seven. Um, so that was kind of part of um, the motivation. And can I ask, <clears throat> I don't know if it's a question for you, um, Scott, or you're the superintendent or chair, but um, you mentioned transportation earlier, and you said you don't need it now. But if there was a time when you requested it, would we have to provide it? I can defer to other folks as well, but um, I, I'm happy to uh, I'm happy to to speak to what I know, um, which is for all private schools in the city. Um, if there are students who live a certain distance, depending on their age, away from uh, the school, um, state law says that 
the city is responsible for providing transportation for those students. Again, um, we're kind of, you know, we've been mindful of that uh, and are in all honesty trying to kind of create diversity, but also create a neighborhood type feel to the school, um, which you can extend into different parts of um, High Park, uh, Roslindale, JP, Mission Hill even, from where we are. Um, so there are um, not many of our, our students who would qualify for that transportation anyway, but those who do um, have said, no, like our intention is to um, get our own children to the school each day. Um, so Scott, um, I just, Please don't take personally anything I'm going to say, but I am a Roslindale resident. And so I have major concerns about what we're trying to create. We're trying to create a BPS community in Roslindale. And I also understand that parents have their own choice to make and I support fully whatever choice, you know, families want to make for, that's best for their children. But I have concerns, the ones that were laid out by Dr. Rivera earlier. But in addition to that is the concern around traffic. So that particular area um, has another school right by it, the BTU school. Uh, additionally to that, there's a ton of new housing around that Forest Hills area. It takes me 45 minutes before this construction is over to get from my street, which I'm only like 10 blocks away, to Forest Hills. And then all of these new apartments are coming on. There's, it's huge, this, the redevelopment in the Forest Hills area. So I'm very nervous about the, tr uh, the traffic um, because it is K to six. I imagine none of those little kids are taking public transportation. And so that's gonna add a huge factor to our neighborhood. Um, so one is that we're trying to create, you know, this neighborhood that already, there are already numerous challenges because we have K to five schools, you know, and then coupled with the transportation, the traffic piece, future transportation asks, which concern me for our budget. Um, and then lastly, that it's K to six, you know, I'm a little bit, I have strong feelings when I hear that families, oh, then they're interested in Boston Public Schools after sixth grade. You know, I feel that to me that's, I have a hard time with that because all the rest of our children that are in BPS, but then you know, are competing with, and it's not, it's not your fault. I, I, please don't take this personally, but I just do have really strong feelings about it as a, as a Rosendale, uh, you know, member of this community and, and what that means for, for our neighborhood. Thank you. Can, uh, can I just address the transportation um, question briefly? Um, and I appreciate all of your thoughts, not just to focus on that one, but um, we have thought about this as well. Um, and it's one of the reasons we have um, a, a very staggered start and end to the school. So there's actually six different dismissal times um, each day and then um, an hour uh, long drop off window. Um, and there's multiple reasons for that, but part of that is to ensure um, that, that there are no significant impacts on, uh, on the local traffic based on um, the size of the school, but also then spreading the coming to and from the school out. And Mr. Given, um, and thank you, uh, Vice Chair, for your questions and, and uh, comments. Um, on the question of obligations um, on the part of the district to provide uh, uh, transportation for students in private schools, it's always been my understanding that um, our obligation extends to students enrolled in parochial or charter schools, but not to other private schools within the city limits. So I'm gonna ask our uh, legal counsel to give us further input on that and whether or not that would have any impact um, on uh, our uh, system as a whole. Again, I, I think that's, that's something helpful for us to know. We often wanna know um, that we're going in the right direction on our, our transportation costs as a district uh, writ large, um, but, that's also, I think, acknowledged through um, some of the discussion tonight around what our limited obligations are under the law, um, a question that's separate from um, what our uh, review process is here for um, the license uh, request that's been put before us. Um, so I want to look around briefly to see if there are further uh, questions or uh, comments uh, from the committee for Mr. Harris and Mr. Given. Uh, well, hearing none, seeing none, um, I'm going to um, thank you both for uh, your presentation tonight. Um, much appreciated that um, you were a, a late addition to our uh, uh, 
um, our agenda um, last week, and we appreciate you being um, in a position to go forward and uh, and present uh, on this presentation tonight. We have a lot of uh, items that have been backed up because of uh, uh, COVID and our switch to online uh, meetings, and so having um, uh, folks that have been willing to be flexible with us in in uh, getting through the work that. Uh, needs to be done this uh, school year has been deeply appreciated. So thank you for that. Um, we'll look forward to Mr. Harris, you providing with that additional information that we requested and um, to taking action on this uh, request at the next meeting. Uh, we'll move on now to public comment on reports. Ms. Sullivan. Thank you. We have a request for public comment on reports. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Ms. Sullivan. Uh, new business from the members. Okay, well, taking a look around, uh, it looks like there's uh, no further, um, there is no new business. Uh, so that concludes our business for this evening. I wanna thank folks for uh, joining us once again. I wanna thank particularly the, uh, I think it's about 32 hearty souls that are non-participants in this meeting that are still with us as attendees. Um, you guys uh, uh, deserve a, a gold star. Um, and we deeply appreciate your um, continuing interest in uh, the school committee and the work that um, our district is engaging in on behalf of our students uh, every day. Um, I do, you know, I think we, we've probably spent some portion of every one of these meetings uh, reflecting on um, just the Herculean effort that our uh, uh, 10,000 employees across the district have been making uh, over the last um, month plus in um, making the transition to online, making the, the um, transition to physical distancing while still maintaining um, uh, learning, uh, appropriate learning environments for our students and continuing just to do the things like feed our students every day the, and, and meet the needs of our, our families. Um, so I can't thank you all um, for those of you with the district and those of our partners that have been working with us for, for doing all of that work. Um, we couldn't, um, we couldn't uh, make it this far without you. And uh, I want to thank once again our, our crack staff, uh, Ms. Sullivan, uh, Ms. Parvex, um, and um, our uh, folks from IT, uh, Ms. Gutierrez and uh, the CIO, Mark Racine, uh, for putting on these meetings. Uh, it's deeply appreciated as well. So if there's um, nothing further, I'll, excuse me, I, I do need to uh, note, because we have concluded our business, uh, the school committee will hold its next meeting on Wednesday, May 13th, back here again on uh, Zoom. And uh, as a further reminder to folks, we will continue to uh, start these school committee meetings at 5 uh, p.m. Um, for uh, uh, the foreseeable future, as long as we remain um, uh, meeting virtually. So uh, if there is a motion to adjourn, I will receive it at this time. So moved. Thank you, Ms. Robinson, is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. O'Neill. And as a reminder, we do need to take a vote. So if there's no discussion or objection to the motion, Ms. Sullivan, will you please call the roll? Dr. Coleman? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Dr. Rivera? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Tran? Yes. Ms. Oliver Davila? Yes. Mr. Lacanto? Yes. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Ms. Sullivan, and thank you once again to uh, my fellow members and uh, to uh, the superintendent and her team. Uh, I wish you all a good night and uh, good health. Popcorn. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.